Peace be upon you all. Esoteric Medicine and Practical Magic by Samael on Veor. Introduction. The hour of great decisions has arrived and there is no time to waste. We are assisting in this last moment of agony of this decayed and degenerated race. The world has covered itself with a horrifying darkness. Painful howls escape from the cavernous abyss. The tempest of exclusiveness has burst and the ray of justice is terribly shining within the august immensity of thought. The great whore, humanity, has been sentenced by the ineffable gods, and now it is falling into the fathomless abyss. The Antichrist, or official science, dressed in purple, is seated on a throne of blasphemies, and as a voracious hyena is devouring human beings without pity and without rest. The hour of great decisions has arrived. In compact and abundant lines of light and glory, the venerated heroes of wisdom are ready to fight the final battle against the false apostles of medicine. The fanaticized forces of official science have been divided into innumerable sects that fight each other. The burial grounds that keep the sacred remnants of beloved relatives are the only mute witnesses of this quarrel. The great whore, humanity, has been fatally wounded. A breath of war escapes from the bottom of the abyss, it is an omen of disgrace. The official science of allopathy, which was satirized from the time of Moliere until the time of Bernard Shaw, has declared itself infallible, and its false pontificates are persecuting the apostles of God. The hour of great determinations has arrived because the innumerable medical sects fanaticized by their exclusivistic leaders have been engaged in a desperate and dishonorable fight to the death. The battlefield is filled with flags. Psychiatrists, allopaths, homeopaths, botanists, naturalists, and biochemists are in combat. They repel each other on this desolate field of human via crucis. Has perhaps the famous Wasserman Syphilographon resolved the problem of syphilis? What specific results have the systems of Neep, Kyles, and Kuhn had on the field of medicine for this great orphan, humanity? Has the problem of leprosy or tuberculosis been somewhat solved at least? What happened with the experiments of Heinemann and Schussler? Perchance, did these experiments cure the human beings of typhus and variola? What about you, ingenuous botanists, who have profaned the plant kingdom by converting it into products of pharmacy? Did you achieve the decimation of the sicknesses of humanity? Stubborn botanists, charlatans, and ignorant deceivers, how is it that you assassinate the medicinal plants in order to cure with their remains? Do you not realize that the plants are the physical bodies of the elemental creatures of nature? Do you not understand that no plant or animal cadaver can cure? Do you believe that life can be animated by dead substances? Do you not know, botanical researcher, that it is not the plant that cures, but it is the elemental of the plant which does so? and that each plant is the physical body of a creature of nature? Listen to me, until now you have done nothing but profane plants as well as ani mal and human cadavers. So, tell me, which one of you knows how to command life? Which one of you botanists, vivisectionists of plants, knows in depth the esotericism of plants? Which one of you knows how to handle the elementals of plants? Simply, each plant organism is the body of an elemental of nature. Therefore, it is not the plant that cures. It is the elemental of the plant, its mantras, and the healing that is performed incessantly that cures. Whosoever wants to officiate in the temple of wisdom has to know how to great command the elemental creatures of the plants. The one who wants to command life has to do the same thing. The elemental of a plant furiously reacts against the herbalist who tears apart its physical body. Therefore, this wounded elemental not only does not cure, but moreover, it harms, because the vitality of the plant is psychologically altered with the anger or with the terror inflicted upon it. The elemental of each plant has its own ritual, mantras and its hours in order to deliver itself to the doctor who knows how to command it with love and impose upon fawns. It with tenderness. The eminent master Paracelsus has expressed in his Fundamenta Sapientia the following. There are two types of knowledge. There is one science and one medical wisdom. The animal comprehension belongs to the animal man, but the comprehension of divine mysteries belongs to the spirit of God within him. 
While medical science is inventing certified medications that are incessantly changing as quickly as women's fashion, there is a very ancient medical wisdom that has its origin based upon the first foundations of the world and that has never changed its formulae. Divine wisdom is preserved in sanctuaries that are far away from this false, materialistic civilization. This medical wisdom is zealously guarded by the masters of wisdom in secret places that are inaccessible to the merchants of the temple. This archaic medical wisdom can cure, with exact formulae, all sicknesses, even the so-called incurable ones. Leprosy, syphilis, and cancer become as insignificant as a child's game before the tremendous power of the Gnostic doctor who commands life. Gnosis is the name of this ancient medical wisdom that from the dawn of creation has never changed its formulae, because these formulae are exact as the Pythagorean tablets. In these formulae, science, mysticism, and royal art are in communion within a divine union. These formulae have their foundation in elementotherapy, the royal art of nature that teaches us how to handle the elemental creatures of plants. These elementals were known in ancient times by such names as dryads, hamadryads, and these plant elementals that are commanded by the Gnostic doctor are the Dussy of St. Augustine, the fairies of the Middle Ages, the Doroic of the Gales, the Grove and Maidens of the Irish, and the anime of the wise Gnostic brothers who are our brethren Indians from the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta, Colombia. The eminent master Paracelsus gives the name of Sylvesters to the elementals of the forests and nymphs to those of aquatic plants. The holy symbology of plants is found broadly exposed in the sacred books of all ancient religions. It is enough for us to remember the tree of the science of good and evil from the Garden of Eden, a tremendous symbol of the sexual force, within which is found the redemption or condemnation of the human being. The Sephirotic tree of the Kabbalah and the Aswada or sacred fig tree are symbols of divine wisdom. Zoroaster represented the nervous system and the liquid system of human beings by the Hayona of the Mazdiists. Other symbols are the Kumbum of Tibet and the Yggdrasil, the Faradides oak of the ancient Celts. All of the ancient religions depict their founders acquiring wisdom under a tree. This is how we see the great Gautama, the Buddha Amitbha, who still lives in ancient India, achieving illumination beneath the Bodhi tree. Christ is an exception to this rule since Christ is the very same wisdom. He is the solar logos whose physical body is the sun. Thus, Christ walks with his sun spirit. In the same way as the human souls walk with their bodies of flesh and bones. Christ is the light of the sun. Therefore, the light of the sun is the light of Christ. The light of the sun is a Christonic substance that makes the plants grow and the seeds sprout. Thus, Within the compact hardness of the grain the substance of the solar logos remains enclosed, and it is what permits the plant to reproduce itself constantly with this glorious, hardy, and active life. Folklore, the history of magic and witchcraft, proven stories of witchcraft assassinations and deaths across vast distances are only possible by commanding the elemental of plants. The miraculous healings from a distance of which the sacred books speak are performed by the Gnostic doctor by means of the elementals of plants. This science that I baptize with the name of elementotherapy, the royal art of medical wisdom, is as ancient as the world. One cannot be a doctor without being a magician, nor can one be a magician without being a doctor. The herbalist and the allopathic doctor are identical in the sense that they only study the physical body of living beings. The Gnostic doctor studies the human being and the plant in their triple aspect of body, soul, and spirit. The Nordic tree Yggdrasil The Gnostic doctor treats plants the same way he treats human beings. The Gnostic therapeutics are mystical, symbolical, and alchemical. There are two types of angels, innocent angels and virtuous angels. The innocent angels are the elementals of plants, and the virtuous angels are perfect human beings. In the glorious India of the Rishis, there is not a town lacking a magical tree whose elemental genie the population renders worship to. The Hellenic traditions sustain that each jungle has its own genie and each tree its nymph. It is not rare to see sacred trees upon the Nilgyris that have graphics on their trunks that are secret figures in vermilion and blue, and at their foot some stones painted in red. These sacred trees are places for sacrifices and praying. 
Remains of animals are found there, and also locks of hair that were offered by the sick and possessed people as an action of thanksgiving to the elemental genie who cured them. The elemental genii of these trees are named manusporms by these people. Commonly, these trees belong to the family of the ilex. Sometimes, these trees belong to the family of the wild cinnamon, and also to the family that is known by the name of Eugenie. Interesting testimonies of some wise men appear in E. Boskowitz's original book. They assert what the indigenous tribes of America have known throughout millions of years, which is that the plants have soul, life, and sensibility similar to that of human beings. In his book Botanical Garden, Erasmus Darwin states that the plant has a soul. We have to remember that before the false lights of this modern civilization came to appear in this world, such eminent men as Democritus, Anaxagoras, and Empedocles sustained the same thesis. In more recent epochs, there are some who sustain that the movements of the roots are willful. Vrolic, Hedwig, Bonnet, Ludwig, and F. Ed. Smith affirm that the plant is susceptible to diverse sensations and that it knows happiness. Finally, the sage Theodorus Fechner wrote a book entitled Nana Odor. Uber das Lennelbinder Pflanzen within which he sufficiently proves that plants have souls. What moves us Gnostics into compassion is that the assertion about the souls of plants only now comes into these scientists' mind, like a very new thesis. Gnosticism has known this from the very birth of the world and it is known by any humble, simple Indian from the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta, Colombia. The knotweed plant is joyous and moves its branches when the wise person who knows how to love it approaches it. The garden poppy, the opium poppy, withdraws its leaves and becomes lethargic many times before being touched by the Gnostic doctor. The elemental of the plant is joyous when we love it and it is filled with pain when we hurt it. The physical organism of the elementals of nature is analogous to that of humans. The respiration of the plants is performed by means of the tracheas of Malpighi that are compounded by a cellular band, coiled in a spiral, that is endowed with contraction and expansion. According to the scientific experiments of Calandrini, Duhamel, and Papin, the only foundation for the plant's life is air. Berthelin sustained that the activity of the air in the sap of the plant is an analogous action to the one that happens in our blood. Experiments of Ingenhis, Mohi, Guerin, Hales, and Theodorus de Saussure scientifically proved that the inferior side of the leaves is filled with tiny little stomach-like mouths. These are the organs for such respiration. The plants inhale carbonic anhydride and exhale oxygen. Their roots serve as a stomach and they emulsify the elements of the earth with their semen by transforming them into ineffable arcana of the substance of God. These arcana are the instruments that the elementals of plants utilize in order to heal the sick person. However, this only occurs when the Gnostic doctor has accomplished the three indispensable requisites, which are love for God and the neighbor, perfect ritual, and exact diagnosis. Elemental therapy teaches the Gnostic doctor how to command the elementals of plants. Elemental therapy is the wisdom that allows the Gnostic doctor to command life. Until now, botanists have been maneuvering the forms, but not the very life of plants. This is because the life of the plants, the world, can only be handled by the Gnostic doctor who has studied elemental therapy. The botanists are the vivisectionists of plants, the profane and profaners of the temple of nature. The allopaths only superficially know how about the biomechanics of organic phenomena, but, regarding the vital foundation, they do not know anything. The allopaths as well as the botanists are skillful in handling cadaverous forms. From the physiological or pathological point of view, we can state with propriety that the allopaths are the vivisectionists of animals and human beings. The homeopaths, biochemists, and their kind are just the prodigal children of botany and allopathy. The hour of great decisions has arrived, and there is no time to waste. To cast out the merchants of the temple with the whip of willpower is what concerns divinized humans. The hour in which we have to liber aid ourselves from every social bondage, schools and sects, religions and dogmas, has arrived, in order to return with happiness into the temple of nature. We must revolutionize ourselves against every type of theosophy, 
pompous Rosicrucianism, and fanatical spiritualism. We must burn the golden calf, money, abandon the cities and return into the bosom of nature. When the human being returns into the bosom of his mother, nature, then she will give him bread, shelter, and wisdom. She, nature, will give him what no leader of political trickery can give him, which are bread, shelter, and wisdom. Now we have to return to the sublime cosmic mysticism of the Blessed Mother of the Hour, in which we must officiate within the temple of the Goddess Mother of the World has arrived. Thus, we will do so with the same wisdom that the human being knew in ancient Arcadia, when he yet to life. Trap himself within this urban we will call the archaic medical wisdom elementotherapy. This is the wisdom of the Gnostic doctors. These kinds of doctors, the Gnostics, are named spirituals because they can command the spirits of herbs and roots. Thus, they, the Gnostic doctors, force the spirits to give liberty to the sick people who they have put into imprisonment. Just like the judge who places a prisoner in the iron trap, this judge is the doctor of this prisoner, because having the keys of the trap, he can close and open the lock at any time that he so pleases. Hippocrates is one of those who belonged to this class of doctors. Paracelsus. Parami Prologo 3. The illustrious German Gnostic doctor Franz Hartmann said, The true doctor is not the result of scientific schools, but the one who became a doctor through the light of divine wisdom itself. You, theologists, who know nothing about God. You, doctors, who ignore the medical science. You, anthropologists, who do not know human nature in all of its manifestations. You, lawyers, who do not have any feeling for righteousness or for justice. You, Christians, who betray the master in every moment. You, judges, who have never judged your own vices and defects. You, governors, who have not learned how to govern your lower passions. You, priests, who exploit the fanatical sects of the world. You, merchants, who do not have respect, not even for the bread that Mother Nature gives to her children. Listen, all of you, you have prostituted everything with your filthy money. Woe to you and your children. Woe to the dwellers of the earth, because they will fall by the knife upon the sidewalks of all cities, and in the darkness of the abyss they will only hear the painful lament and the gnashing of teeth. The official medicine has exploited human pain. When the human being separated himself from nature in order to imprison himself within this urban life, he then fell into the hands of the tenebrous potencies. Thus, he learned the false science from the magicians of the darkness. It was then when he knew pain. Now, the human being has to return to the bosom of nature in order to recuperate the lost positions. Each elemental of nature represents certain powers of the blessed goddess mother of the world. Thus, whosoever knows how to handle the powers of nature that are enclosed within each herb, within each root and each tree, is the only one who see can be a true magician and doctor. Thought is a great force, yet everything is dual in creation. Thus, if we want to make perceptible any hidden intention, physical instrument that serves as the clothing for that idea is necessary. This instrument is the plant that corresponds to our intention. Only the one who knows the secret of commanding the elementals of plants can be a magician. The use of animal magnetism, the transmission of life, mumia, the transplantation of sicknesses and other analogous things that were wisely described by Paracelsus, Cornelius, Agrippa, are only possible for the Gnostic doctor who knows how to handle the elemental creatures of the plants. The transmission of thought becomes easy when one operates through the elementals of plants. As we have already stated, everything in nature is dual. Those very well-known systems of Marden, Atkinson, Mesmer, Paul Jagot, and the pseudo-spiritualist schools will never teach the human being the wise use of the force of thought, because force and forces are something very joined in creation. Every mental wave has its exponent in a plant. In order for the mental waves to be crystallized, they must be revest with the esoteric powers of the plant that corresponds to it. There is nothing in the universe that is not dual. If the athletes of concentration of thought do not know how to combine their mental waves with the powers of nature, which are enclosed within the plants, they will then waste their time miserably. While the human being does not return into the bosom of nature, 
his thoughts as well as his life will always be totally superficial and artificial and, therefore, negative and iniquitous. The human being must abandon his false idols and temples of urban life and return into the bosom of the blessed goddess mother of the world. She will give you light, wisdom, power, and glory. The prodigal children will return into the temples of nature when they abandon their urban life and return into the bosom of the goddess nature. The temples of the goddess mother of the world which are situated in the gorge of mountains and profound valleys only wait for the human being to knock at their doors in order to welcome him and to grant him love and wisdom, bread and shelter. These are the commandments of the Blessed One. Until now, beloved disciples, you have only heard comments about Oriental Tibet and of the holy masters who dwell there. Franz Hartmann comments to us about the masters of the esoteric temple of Bohemia and Krumheller, Huracoca, comments about the temple of Montserrat in Spain and the temple of Chapultepec in Mexico. Yet, our beloved South America also has its majestic temples, even if no one has spoken about them. These are the temples of goddess nature, these are the temples of the sacred mysteries of the Mayan Ray. Until now you have only heard comments about the Asian and European masters. Many spiritualist students would like to progress internally, however they cannot because they have not found the path that belongs to them, as well as their Ray and their own keynote, which must be in accordance with their blood and psyche. We must not forget that in South America the blood of the American Indian predominates over everything. Thus, there are mill lions of human beings who belong to the Mayan Ray. I am going to talk about the masters of the Mayan Ray. I am going to unveil for the first time the veil that hides them. Kaliswanga, the primeval god of light, the great master of the sun, has a storehouse of esoteric wisdom in the temple of Buritaka, headquarters of ancient wisdom, Atlantic coast. Kunchavito Muya, a powerful god. Muestro Sayankua. Muestro Padre Sukal, Mama Queso Biscund, Mama Batunare, La Saga Maria Pastora, a female master of wisdom. The god Quinmagua, this master, is the god of tempests, who has power over the seasons spring, summer, autumn, and winter. The god Tembler is an innocent child who makes the earth tremble, and whose name speaks for itself. Tembler means tremble in Spanish. These masters of the Venerable White Lodge from the Mayan Ray are the silent vigilantes of Latin America. The mountain range of the Sierra Nevada from Santa Marta, Colombia, is another powerful and very ancient Tibet. Kaliswanga, the primeval god of light, will joyfully admit into his mysteries the souls who are thirsty for the Mayan Ray. The clue in order to enter into the temple of Kaliswanga, the Mayan Indian master, is the following. The disciple will sit on a chair before a table. He will place his elbows on the table and will hold his head with his left hand. Meanwhile, he will perform magnetic passes by passing his right hand over his head from the forehead to the neck, with the purpose of magnetizing himself. Thus, with force, he will thrust, with the magnetic passes, his astral body outwards, towards the temple of Buritaka, which is the headquarters of the ancient wisdom of the Mayan Ray. The disciple will unite his willpower and imagination in vibrating harmony and will make the effort to fall asleep. While utilizing his willpower and imagination, he must feel as if he was within the temple of Buritaka with his body of flesh and bones. He must mentally pronounce the following mantras or magical words. Omnis bon igneous these words are pronounced in succession, prolonging the sound of the vowels until falling asleep. After practicing for a while, the disciple will then go out of his physical body with his astral body, and Kaliswanga, the sublime master of the Mayan Ray, will instruct him in his mysteries and teach him the medical wisdom. First of all, Kaliswanga tests the courage of the invoker. He appears gigantic and terrible in order to test the disciple. If the disciple is courageous, he will be instructed in the sacred science of the mamas. The Gnostic doctors of the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta cure syphilis in 15 days. They cure the last degree of leprosy precise months. They cure 15 days. In nine tuberculosis and there is no sickness that the Arwakos mamas cannot cure. Therefore, they laugh at the science of the civilized ones of this 20th century. The mamas affirm that in order for this modern civilization to reach the degree of their Mayan culture, 
hundreds of years would have to pass. Upon the ice-covered summits of the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta, there lives a powerful initiate sage whose age is really indescribable. This great illuminated one is the President Mama of the of the Arwako Indians. Government this President Mama has powers over creation in its entirety. He is profoundly venerated by all of the Indians of the whole Sierra Nevada. In his possession is an octahedron crystal upon a tripod, which reflects the images of all people who march in order to meet this venerable elder. No matter how distant they might be, the mamas diagnose sicknesses by placing a sphere of glass over the neck of the patient. In such a way, they examine the interior of the organism better than if using x-rays. They smile with disdain at the complicated mechanisms of official medical science. They diagnose the sickness of an ill person simply by placing the sphere of glass over the clothing of the ill one, even if the patient might be can many distant miles away. Any one of the modern scientists perform this? How interesting it would be if someone would postpone their university proficiency by making an effort to study Mayan medicine in the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta, Colombia. Tricksters are the outcome of intellectualism without spirituality, and these individuals have been and are the disgrace of this world. The Indian doctors cure, and many of their healings are instantaneous because disciple. They have known about the proper managing of the elementals since times. Very ancient, there are also temples of light in Taganga and Gera, Atlantic coast of Colombia. The great initiates of the Mayan raid dwell in all of those esoteric temples. The majestic temple of the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta is the august sanctuary of the high initiates of La Sierra. Those temples are in the Jinn state, that is, within the fourth dimension. They are the great cathedrals of nature, where the great sages of the snake dwell. The clue in order to travel in the astral body in the form already described is given thanks to Kalaswanga, the powerful god, child of the seven red seas and of the seven rays of the sun. When the disciples practice the clue, they will go out of their physical bodies each time they wish to do so. Thus, they will attend the temples of the Mayan Ray in their astral bodies in order to receive instructions of medical wisdom. The High Mama initiates communicate with the Mahatmas from Tibet, and they know the plants of Oriental India in depth. The president of the Arwako Indians submerges himself into a mysterious vessel filled with a rare liquor, then when he comes out of it his physical body is already within the astral plane. In this way, in a few instants, he transports himself, with his physical body and all, to wherever he wants. Nevertheless, these wise Indians are tremendously quiet and humble. Therefore, no civilized person will ever attain their secrets, unless the person has become worthy and deserves to be received as a I have to give thanks in this book for the excellent data that Dionisito de la Cruz had the good deed of providing me with for my investigations about the Sierra Nevada. He is a resident of Finca Tierra Grada, which is located 20 kilometers from Foundation. I have to also give thanks to an Indian from the Bolivar State in Colombia for the data he provided for this book. The data was magnificent. I also present my thanks to the Master Paracelsus, who inspected and corrected the original copy of this book, with the goal that this book will accomplish the solemn mission that has been assigned to it in the future age of Aquarius. I also give thanks to the Master Kalaswanga for his marvelous clue that will especially allow those Latin American disciples of Aboriginal blood to put themselves in contact with the Temples of Mysteries of the Mayan Ray. There are parts of the Colombian territory where Aboriginal blood is extremely opulent, in the state of Bocaya, for example, the disciples whose blood is markedly Indian could learn to depart in their astral bodies with the clue of the master Kalaswanga and to receive esoteric instruction in the temples of the Mayan Ray, which is the native ray of America. I also give thanks to the masters Moria, Kauthomi, Hippocrates and others for their cooperation in this solemn mission that has been entrusted to me. As well, I give thanks to my saintly guru whose sacred name must not be uttered. I is Samael on Veor the master of the Egyptian mysteries, and the great avatar of Aquarius, the initiator of the new era, the master of strength. The hour of great decisions has arrived, and there is no time to waste. We are assisting in this last moment of agony of this decayed and degenerated race. 
Now is the time for us to grasp the sword of justice in order to unmask the traitors and disconcert the tyrants. Introduction to Esoteric Medicine The Faculties of Medicine The vanity of erudite does not come from heaven, but they learn it from one another, and upon this base they edify their church. Paracelsus, Fundam Sap Frame In a magazine from Berlin, Bruno Noah textually states the following. His Excellency, the Rector of the University of Halle, Sir Professor Dr. Hanna states in his discourse February 2nd, 1934, I have the sufficient courage of publicly declaring myself in favor of astrology, and that it is time to recognize astrology as a science. I regret the fact of not having preoccupied myself before with astrology. It is provable that the honorable body of doctors from Berlin could evaluate the authorized declaration of Dr. Hanna. Of course, this doctor is neither a snob opportunist nor a galenist impostor. Astrology is a science that the time of the first goes back to ages of humanity. All of the very ancient schools of medicine drank from this fountain of inexhaustible wisdom. Since this is a fact, and certainly a true fact, the delayed recognition from this German doctor does not grant any merit to astrology. However, his recognition is with merit. The Arhuaco Indians from the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta, Colombia has astrology and medicine as the infallible, indispensable system of their medical teachings. Astrology and medicine are part of one and the same complicated organism. Since they never ignored astrology, they have no need to feel regret. Hence, to use one of these two parts, astrology and medicine, or to study one of these two elements while disregarding the other is anachronistic and anti-scientific. Dr. Walter Krisch from Stralsund states, Dr. Krumheller founded a new theory about the organs of the senses that opens new horizons for sensorial physiology. Much has been spoken now about the sixth sense and it has been found that it has to be searched for within the fourth dimension. The medical system of the Arhuaco Indians from the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta is analogous to the one of the Lamas from Tibet. Thus, Regarding sensorial physiology and human anatomy, they are in an envious position in comparison with the greatly boastful ones of modern sapients. The Arhuaco doctors study medicine for 13 years and the minimum time for the Lama doctors from Tibet is 12 years. The Arhuaco student of medicine remains cloistered for precisely 13 years within a dwelling of two rooms. His studies are initiated when he is seven years old, and he graduates when he is 21 years old. The nourishment of the student is administered through one window and the teachings from his instructor along with the medicinal plants are administered through another window. The teacher who knows the least is the one who starts teaching him and the teacher who knows the most is the one who is the last. The number of instructors vary according to the educational courses that he is receiving. Each teacher has his or her own sack of plants. The study of the plants is related to their elementals and to their hidden powers. This is the ancient science of elementotherapy. During the night, outside of his dwelling, the disciple is instructed by the teachers of astrology and practical magic. In order to receive this instruction, he has to develop clairvoyance or the sixth sense, which was intuited by the Dr. Krish from Stralsund. The procedure in order to develop clairvoyance that the Arwako students of medicine utilize is as follows. The disciple stands still, contemplating upon a star from heaven, while holding a reed in his hand. Then, he strives to perceive the place that his teacher wishes him to. After a certain time of daily practice, there will truly be no place on earth, as remote as it might be, that the student will not see from the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta. The Indians from the state of Bolivar, Colombia, develop the sixth sense with the following procedure. At six o'clock past meridian, the aspirant places a bottle of rum, a clock, a lit candle, and a plate with food on the ground underneath a tree that could be a guasimo, guazuma olmifolia lamarck olive, totamo, calabash tree, crescentia cugit l, or clover bush. The aspirant consumes the food while he fixedly and penetratingly looks at the rum, candle, and clock. These Indians always execute these practices with their face towards the setting sun and they pronounce the Christian creed filled with faith. Thursdays and Fridays of the special days in order to perform them are 
The sensorial organs of our senses are the sources of information for our mind. When these senses are finer, we have a better perception of the things that surround us. Therefore, our conceptual judgment is more exact. The German physicist Alfred Jutt sustains that a pure-blooded individual hears eight complete octaves of the note soul, with two lines of frequency, 96.825, or with lines of frequency of 24,787,200. The measure for half-blooded Europeans is much less in their low or high auditory zone. The pure-blooded Aborigines enjoy more fine senses. If we add to them the awakening of clairvoyance, or the sixth sense located in the epiphysis gland, then a more penetrating sensorial perception and a pure source of objective information is attained. This is impossible for the students from the official faculties of medicine to obtain because of the lack of appropriate methods. The Arwako Indians and the Tibetan Lamas know the human anatomy in depth. The texts of official anatomy are lacking the anatomy of the internal bodies of the human being, who is septuple in his internal constitution. Behold, here are the seven bodies of the human being. 1. Physical body. 2. Vital body. 3. Astral body. 4. Mental body. 5. Body of willpower. 6. Body of the consciousness. 7. Espiritus, the innermost. The illustrious master Paracelsus classifies them as follows. 1. The limbus. 2. The Mumia. 3. The Archaeus. 4. The Sidereal Body. 5. Edek, the internal man or mental body made of the flesh of Adam. 6. Aluek. 7. Body of the Innermost. These are the seven organisms made of distinct matters or degrees of subtilization, which any professor of medicine could perceive if he could develop his clairvoyance with the procedures that are given here in this book. A study of anatomy has to embrace in its conjunction the seven bodies of the human being in all of its interrelations in order for it to be complete. Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, admits that Nisus formativus, the astral body, or Linga Sarira of the Theosophists, does exist. These distinct internal bodies of the human being work over our endogenous glands and over our hormones. One cannot be a physician without knowing in depth the nisus formativus to which Immanuel Kant refers. Other senses of the human being function by means of electromagnetic oscillations. Lakoski, the great Russian sage, founder of the emanative theory, reached the conclusion that everything radiates and that everything is energy. It is absolutely impossible to be a physician in its whole significance without being a clairvoyant and without having studied anatomy biology, and the pathology of all the seven bodies of the human being. The master Paracelsus states, There are two types of flesh, the flesh of Adam, the physical body, that is the terrestrial flesh, which is gross. The flesh that is not derived from Adam is of a subtle species. It is not made from a gross matter, and it can penetrate through all the walls without the necessity of doors or holes. Nonetheless, both species of flesh have their blood and bones, and both also differ from the spirit. De Nymphus, Paracelsus These energetic internal bodies of the human being are material organisms, which the physician must know about in depth in order to diagnose the sicknesses without any mistake, without committing any stupidity. To know official chemistry is worthless if esoteric chemistry is unknown. It is worthless to know exterior biology if the internal biology of the seven bodies of the human being is unknown. In like manner, it is worthless to know only about exterior anatomy without knowing about internal anatomy. In the laboratory, the theoretical study of bacteriology would be futile without a microscope. It is absurd to study medicine without previously having developed positive clairvoyance, which permits us to see and handle the seven bodies of the human being. The methods of diagnosis of the official science are insufficient. For this reason, the majority of patients die without knowing what their sickness was. The Indian Geronimo Montano would place a crystal ball on the neck of the sick person, which allowed him to see the organism through it better than x-rays would. When it was necessary to diagnose a distant patient, 
it was enough for him to humidify his crystal ball with rum and to envelope it within the clothing of the sick person. Thus, in this singular manner, he knew what the sickness was, and he was able to diagnose it with certainty. On one occasion, two skeptical persons brought the hat of a dead man to the Indian Geronimo so that he could tell them to whom the hat belonged. Thus, Geronimo took the hat in his hands and invited the two skeptical people into his clinic. Then, with a loud voice he told them, Behold, the owner of this hat is here. The two skeptical ones became shocked when they saw the very defunct man of the experiment seated upon a chair. I would like to see a pupil who is in his last year of medical school diagnose someone in the presence of a mama from the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta. It would be funny, very funny. When finalizing the studies in medicine, the Arwako pupil is examined by all of his teachers and in the presence of the government of Indians from the Sierra. One by one, each teacher examines him with their sack of plants. The astrologers examine him in astrology, the magicians examine him in practical magic, etc. The exam on plants is related to the esotericism of them. That is to say, with the elementotherapy, therapy, which is ignored by botanists. The schools of medicine of the Lamas from Oriental Tibet do it in their proper way. One of their specialties is osmotherapy, or healing through perfumes. We copied the following prayer from a Lama's prayer book, which is mentioned by Krumheller. Sublime flowers, chosen rosaries of little flowers, music and ointments of delectable fragrance, resplendent lights and the best perfumes, I bring to the victorious ones, the Buddhas, magnificent tunics and extra fine perfumes, little sacks filled with cut aromatic burning sticks, which are equal in number to the mountains of Miru and all of the most beautiful creations, I bring to the victorious ones. FRHR von Perkhammer painted an illustration that is mentioned by Dr. Krumheller. In this illustration appeared a lama who is on the patio of Yungo Kung, in the Temple of the Eternal Peace. He is portending alongside of a censer. Perfumes are never absent within the lama's convent of the hundred thousand images of Mithraya. Dr. Rudolf Steiner affirms that the employment of perfumes for the healing of sicknesses has a very remote past and a splendid future. Leadbeater said that our sins and faults bounce back into the astral body and that they can be eliminated through the action of certain perfumes. Each vice has its own larvae that are attached to the astral body. Thus, the total healing of those vices is achieved only by the disintegration of those larvae by means of certain perfumes. There are statues of Buddha made with perfumed sandalwood in Peking, Tibet, and in the Mongolian cloister of Erdoni DSU. These statues remain enveloped with aromatic herbs that are utilized in order to perform distant healings. These statues are named Sko, written J-E, because of the abbreviation of Jeeb, which means Lord or Master. They are also in Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. Schemaperma is the name of certain cloth balls that are filled with aromatic herbs that Tibetans and Mongolians hang on the ceilings of their temples for healing purposes. Krumheller mentions to us in one of his books that Lama Rinchen practiced medicine in Berlin with the essences he brought from Tibet. He never bought a single drug in Berlin. As Huiracoca tells us, his mission was to care for the resident Mongolians. The severe studies of Himalayan and Trans-Himalayan medicine include elementotherapy, osmotherapy, anatomy of the seven bodies, astrology, and esoteric chemistry. Every Lama physician is a clairvoyant. Indeed, truly, one cannot be a physician without being a clairvoyant. Listen to this, gentlemen of official medicine. The diagnosis through percussion and auscultation and the manner in which a blind man moves and walks are analogous. To use the sense of touch in order to orient oneself in a diagnosis is absolutely unsure and puerile. The Arwako and Lama physicians do not need those antiquated methods of diagnosis from official medicine for anything, since they are only good for blind men. The Arwako and Lama physicians have developed the sixth sense, clairvoyance. Thus, they can see directly the causes of the sickness and its effects in the internal bodies. There is a subterranean city in the profound Amazon jungles. Some Occidental yogis dwell there. The sacred treasures of submerged Atlantis are zealously kept within this mysterious city. 
These sage yogi physicians are the zealous guardians of the very ancient medical wisdom. Another mysterious city also exists within the thick jungles of California. This city will never be discovered by the civilized people of this 20th century. Here is where a surviving race from ancient Lemuria dwells. This race is the most ancient depository of the precious treasure of medical wisdom. Likewise, in Central America there are various sanctuaries of medicine based on the royal art of nature. Thus, in our world there is no scarcity of secret places where this medical wisdom is cultivated and studied. The human being knew this wisdom in former times, when he lived away from this vicious atmosphere of urban life. Epidemics put the world in mourning. Death advances triumphantly and devastatingly everywhere. The transitory power of allopathic medicine is abdicating before the avalanche of human pain. The hour in order to return to nature, the hour to withdraw into the countryside in order to learn the teachings that I give in this book has arrived. Thus, in the profound peace of the forests is where we must establish nurseries of medical wisdom, similar to those sanctuaries in Tibet and the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta. Youth with genius, defenseless humanity, unsatisfied people, let us go into battle with this reconquered flag that I raise on high towards all winds. Let us go to battle against scientific exclusivity. Let us go to war against all that is harmful and antiquated. To the battle for Aquarius. To the battle for the new era. Medical clinics. The one who can cure sicknesses is a physician. Neither the emperors, nor the popes, nor the colleges, not even the superior schools can create physicians. They can grant privileges and make a person who is not a physician appear as if he is a physician. They can grant unto this person permission to kill, but they cannot give him the power to heal. They cannot make of that person a true physician, unless that person has already been ordained by God. Paracelsus In order to be a true physician, it is necessary to have wisdom. The word wisdom is derived from vid, vidir, to see, and from dom, judgment. Thus, wisdom alludes to that which one can see with the senses of the soul and of the innermost, to the wise judgments which must be based on the ultrasensorial perceptions and not simply on dogmatic intellectualism or vain professional sufficiency, which are already in declination and decrepitude. Therefore, how can a person who is yet to develop his clairvoyance reach wisdom? How can a person who is not a physician to himself be a physician to others? How can a person who is not sane in his heart heal others? 50% of medical clinics, there is no sin of exaggeration here, are simulated brothels. If not, then let the other 50% of innocent physicians attest to this. The aristocratic lady and the humble peasant girl adulterate within the medical clinics. The blushing of young wives or of bashful virgins cannot prevail in order to stop the outrage of those physicians who see and touch what is secret and prohibited. Indeed, they do this because of their repressed or insatiable libido, which foreign called sexual appetite, never before had they such an opportunity to devour women's chastity and to sacrifice their integrity. An authentic physician must be absolutely chaste and righteous, or at least tender in his heart. Therefore, is it wisdom to work in that manner against the moral laws? Is this culture? Is it civilization? What could this behavior be called? When human beings endowed with superior intelligence appeared upon the earth, they allowed this supreme power, the innermost, to work without resistance within them. Thus, they learned their first lessons from him. All that they had to do was imitate him but in order to reproduce the same effects by an effort of individual will, they found themselves obliged to develop in their human constitution a creative power, the Kundalini, named Kriyashakti in esoteric terminology. In order to be a physician, the fire of the Holy Spirit is necessary. This fire is the outcome of the transmutations of our sexual secretions by means of the snake. How can one whose soul is stained because of love for profit and because of an insatiable thirst for fornication serve as a vehicle of expression for the innermost? The innermost within us is our internal master, our God, our real being. Our spirit, our superior self, our father who is in secret. The innermost is an ineffable flame of the great bonfire. 
He is a fragment of the Absolute in our heart. According to Moses, the innermost within us is the Ruach Elohim, who sowed the waters in the beginning of the world. The innermost is the Monad of Carpocrates, the Daimon of Socrates, the Sadi of Tibetans, the silent Gandharva or celestial musician of the Hindus. The innermost is our Father within us, the Soul is the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the sexual force, which is named Kundalini and is symbolized by the snake. The human being becomes an authentic physician anointed by God when he develops within his human constitution the power of the fire. In this way, the divine innermost expresses himself through the anointed one. He then can perform astonishing healings. A human being could theoretically study the human organism and its sicknesses. However, this does not signify that he has the power of healing, since no one can receive this power from men, but only from God. In the sunny country of Chem, there in those foregone times of ancient Egypt, sick people were not taken into medical clinics. They were taken into the august and sacred temples where the hieratratic wisdom was cultivated. Hence, sick people came out sane and sound from the temples. A lethargy of eternities weighs upon the ancient mysteries. The delectable verb of ancient sages, who engraved their wisdom in strange embossments upon unconquered walls, seems to be perceived there in that remote distance, within the profound night of the ages. Streets had millinery sphinxes that silently contemplated thousands of pilgrims who came from distinct lands in search of health and light. Faces were tawny due to the ardent sun of happy Arabia. People came from Chaldea, Judaic merchants came from Cyclopes or from Tyre, old yogis came from the sacred land of the Vedas. Medicine was always sacred. Medicine was always the blessed patrimony of the Magi. Sick people in those the insert foregone times of ancient Egypt covered themselves with aromas within the temples, and the ineffable verb of the holy masters filled them with life. When all of this was occurring, the great whore, humanity, still had not begotten the Antichrist or the false science and the pontiff of all the abominations of the earth had not yet seated himself upon his seven hills. In those fully developed ages, and under those sacred colonnades, the priest of Sais exclaimed, Alas, Solon, Solon, my son! The day in which the men will laugh at our sacred hieroglyphics will come. Thus, they will say that we, the ancient people, were worshipping idols. Medical clinics will be abolished in the age of Aquarius. Healing sanctuaries will be opened everywhere. It will not matter if we have to tolerate with stoicism the swats from the claws of the beast, whose number is 666. To the battle, children of the light, for our ideas, for the triumph of truth and goodness, to the battle. Healing Sanctuaries We are in a solitary spot of a tropical 4 EST. Here everything breathes a profound mysterious air. A long time ago, a race of illuminated sages once lived in this place, before our beloved Americas were invaded by the Spanish hordes. In this stead named Cavinas, in the state of Bolivar close to the town of San Andres, Colombia, is where some Gnostic sages of an indigenous race still live. We are at the outlook of an enchanted well. A Sylvester, a creepy crawling creature called a Cienpes, centipede, by the natives of that region walks around the well, then it disappears within the waters. Everything is saturated by a mysterious air. Some mummies that have become petrified over the centuries seem like they are spying upon all of our actions. We are before the presence of a healing sanctuary. Some pilgrims who come from distant lands in search of health are muttering prayers of pity. This is the way they ask permission from the defunct mama who heals to enter into his sanctuary where his mummy seems to smile. It is an essential obligation for all the pilgrims to ask permission of the defunct one in order to move ahead. When the pilgrim violates this precept, then the sky fills with dense, large, Black clouds and a terrible tempest is unleashed. It seems as if the indignant mama is whipping the region with his fiery whip. Some riches, that no one dares to touch because they are enchanted, exist in this stead. When approaching the mummy, these pilgrims collect some plants, soil or metals, with which they are miraculously cured. This mama, in spite of being dead, keeps commanding and healing. Undoubtedly, he is a king and priest of the universe. 
This is what a Gnostic priest is. He is a king and a priest of the universe. Who knows how to command and to bless? The healing sanctuary of every Gnostic doctor must have its altar made of cypress wood or scented wood. It is necessary to wash the wooden altar with hot water and perfumed soap before it is consecrated. The altar table is consecrated when it is rubbed with a sponge imbibed with rose water and when it is smeared with a mastic made from white virgin wax, evergreen resin, frankincense, aloe, thyme, pine resin, and Smyrna incense. The altar table can also be made out of cedar wood, which is the wood of Joseph the Initiate, the father of Jesus of Nazareth. Cedar has great hidden powers. The gigantic cedars of the forests communicate amongst themselves by means of lugubrious thuds that resound in remote sites on Good Thursdays and Good Fridays. A tablecloth must always be over the altar table of the healing sanctuary, and over this a folded tablecloth is placed that is embroidered with pictures that represent dramas from Christ's Passion. These embroidered tablecloths are similar to the corporal of the Roman Church. The cups in sacred chalices, as well as the vessels that are filled with vegetable substances that are given to the sick people to drink, must be placed over the embroidered tablecloth. The phial filled with perfumes, which is a metallic cylindrical and prismatic cup, with a base or foot of a goblet, must not be missing on this altar table either. This phial must have over its lid a little metallic tower or little metallic flag made out of tin or copper, which are the metals of Jupiter and Venus. In order to cure the sick person, the patient must be surrounded by intense perfumes. Frankincense is the principal vehicle for the curative waves of the mind of the medic magician, in combination with the vegetable elementals. Some aromatic plants can be added to the frankincense such as flowers of cypress, spikenard, saffron, amber, calamus, aloe, and powder from spices. The Gnostic medic will never use perfumes or scented substances that contain mineral substances, because those are used in order to perform black magic. The perfumes shall be blessed with the following prayer. Praise be thou, O Lord our God, King of the world, who created all the species of aromas. Tibetan medicine divides the scented essences into five groups, repugnant, penetrating, piquant, aromatic, rancid, and savory. Sick people who require curative perfumes will be medicated with the utensil for perfumes. Perfumed candles shall never be missing upon the altar of the Gnostic medic, because the fire of the candles acts in an effective way over the subconsciousness of the sick person. In Tibet, the philosopher Mahayana wrote a whole book about the preparation of perfumed candles. The Gnostic medic must extinguish the fire of a candle within a cup of wine after every curative operation. This is an action of thanksgiving to the gods of fire. In every healing sanctuary, twelve balls of cloth filled with aromatic herbs must be hung from the ceiling. Each ball will contain the corresponding herbs related to the zodiacal sign. Therefore, the twelve balls will contain the herbs of the twelve zodiacal signs. A sick person will feel an improvement in health begin when inhaling the curative perfumes of his or her zodiacal sign. The folklorist Garay describes in his book Traditions and Chants from Panama how the shamans envelop the sick people with perfumes and how these shamans chant mantras to them while they are medicated. The healing sanctuaries must have a floor of white and black tiles and the Gnostic medic must use a colored robe in his sanctum. Evil thoughts must never profane the sanctuary whose portal must have this inscription displayed. Thou who enters, leave thy evil thoughts behind. Diagnostic System Presently, there are innumerable systems of diagnosis that in depth are nothing more than simple guides for the blind. These systems guide fanatical blind people of different medical schools throughout their complex and tortuous ways of organism symptomatology. 90% of people die ignoring the cause of their sicknesses. There are many who say that the human being is a microcosm. Yet, few are those who comprehend what this signifies. Just as the universe is an organism with all of its constellations, likewise, the human being is a world in himself. Just as the visible firmament, space, is not governed by any creature, Likewise, the firmament that is within the human being, the mind, is not subjected to any other creature. This firmament, mental sphere, 
in the human being has its planets and stars, mental states, as well as its elevations, conjunctions and oppositions, states of being related with sentiments, thoughts, emotions, ideas, love, and hatred, and can be labeled as you wish. Just as all the celestial bodies in space are united to one another by invisible links, so the organs within the human being are not entirely independent of one another, but they are subordinated by certain degrees. Amongst themselves the heart is a sun, the brain is its moon, the spleen is its Saturn, the liver its Jupiter, the lungs its Mercury and the kidneys its Venus. Paramirum 3, 4, Paracelsus Esoterically, the sun of our organism is Saturn, Mercury is the chest and the fear are the sexual organs. The map of the stars is within the human organism. Saturn is the sun that governs the belly. For more details, read our zodiacal course. Organs, nerves, muscles, etc., are only the physical instruments of certain principles and powers in which their activity is based. In order for one to exactly diagnose a sickness, clairvoyance is necessary. Every sickness has its causes within the interior universe of the human being. Thus, in order to enter within this profound interior universe, one needs to be clairvoyant. Freud approached this reality with his psychoanalysis. However, he did not delve into it completely, because he lacked the development of his clairvoyance or sixth sense. The diagnosis by percussion and auscultation is already very antiquated. Consequently, a major amount of doctors are abandoning it. Iridology, so proclaimed by the great iridologist Vitorazaga, is also deficient, because the lines of the iris are so extremely fine that even with lenses that are six times magnified they can easily mislead the medic. Medical chirology, so proclaimed by Dr. Krumheller, Wiracoca, has the same defects as iridology, since the lines of the hands present signs of sicknesses very complex and very difficult to diagnose. These are confusing and untranslatable in many cases. We bring into account the scandalous event that happened some years ago in a college of Bogota, Colombia. A calm mission of physicians, sickened by carnal passion, presented themselves at a college for girls in order to perform sexual examinations. It was then that the Dr. Loriano Gomez energetically protested in the name of society because of this kind of infamy. This clearly reveals to us to what limit the sadism of these false apostles of medicine has reached. Their refined lechery does not even respect the purity of innocent girls. The doctors from hospitals of charity have converted those institutions into centers of corruption. The pregnant women within the maternity halls are despoiled from their dresses and in the most sadistic and criminal their sexual organs are publicly exhibited. This is in order for those groups way of bookworm students from the university, who are filled with hidden anxieties of copulation, to study and excite their own passions before the sad spectacle of their defenseless victims. The most horrible crimes are executed daily within the clinics with all of their instruments for surgery. A doctor who took advantage of his patients for the benefit of advertisements by exhibiting them in the supreme moment of child deliverance before strange people had to escape from the city of Cali. The innovative systems of diagnosis in laboratories have only achieved the increasing number of sicknesses and defunct ones. The invalids from hospitals of charity are scoffed at and humiliated as if they were not human beings, but outcasts. These civilized gentlemen physicians have converted the human organism into a simple thing for experimentation, for an essay, for a test. This lack of respect for the bodies of our fellow men is rooted in the ignorance of the existence of the internal vehicles. Newborn children are separated from their mothers at the moment of birth, with the pretext of hygiene. These doctors ignore that the newborn child needs the vital aura of his mother for the development of the biology of his body, which is a way in formation. These scientists ignore that when the newborn child is placed far from the irradiation of the vital body of his mother, he gets sick and is in danger of dying. To want to correct nature is pedantry. It is unforgivable imbecility. If we observe creation in its entirety, we will then see every mother sleeping with her newborn creature. The hen spreads her wings and covers her chicks during the night. All the animals give heat and protection to their children. Only the deranged scientists want to correct the work of God.
The mother's placenta which should be buried in a hot place in order to avoid consequences is often thrown into the dunghills. These doctors ignore the intimate bioelectromagnetic relationship that exists between the placenta and the organism of the sick woman. A placenta that is thrust into the dunghill or into the water is the cause of multiple and future sicknesses of the womb and other organs. Therefore, when those poor mothers present themselves asking for health and medicine within the clinics, the physicians, with their false diagnosis, prescribe to them a countless amount of remedies, which instead of healing them make them even more sick. When the Arwako doctors need to excite their sixth sense in order to diagnose, they drink a special medicinal decoction that puts their clairvoyant power into total activity. The formulae is as follows. Obtain a bottle of rum, 10 centigrams of internal seed of lemon verbena, one seed from inside the fruit of the sandbox tree, Hura crepitans DC, Jabila, and five sage leaves. The whole of this is left to macer eight for several days. This beverage has the virtue of raising the blood towards the head in order to give force to those glands where the sixth sense is situated. We, the Gnostics, do not need this beverage. These plants can be found in the state of Magdalena, Colombia. In the systems of diagnosis of medical wisdom, the magician uses an apparatus called a clairdolidoscope in order to clairvoyantly observe the organism. This lens is constructed in the following way inside of a steel tube of about 20 centimeters in length and 5 centimeters in diameter two small crystal balls with stripes of blue green yellow and red colors must be inserted this lens is for clairvoyance as the microscope is for the optical nerve of the menic this clairdolidoscope must be blessed with a branch from a pine tree and three fruits of cadillo mono must be hung from its sides like balls the Cadillo Mano is a plant that grows one or two meters tall in Colombia. The Gnostic medic will take the sick son into his healing sanctuary. Then, with his sixth sense and with the help of his perclertoliodoscope, he will perform the corresponding exam of the organism. Thus, he will give an exact diagnosis. Within this sanctuary, the young females will not need to undress their bodies. They will not entertain any passionate person. Neither will the women need to renounce their integrity in order to submit themselves to the exam of any sexually unsatisfied one, since here, only wisdom and respect will exist. The five causes of illness. The five causes of illness are the following. 1. Ends astrale. 2. Ends venery. 3. Ends espirituale. 4. Ends naturi. 5. Ends Day. Master Paracelsus states, all sicknesses have their beginning in some of the three substances, salt, sulfur, and mercury, that is to say, they can have their origin in the world of matter, symbolized by the salt, in the sphere of the soul, symbolized by the sulfur, or in the kingdom of the mind, symbolized by the mercury. In order to better comprehend this aphorism of Master Paracelsus, let the internal constitution of the human being be studied. Read The Perfect Matrimony and The Revolution of Beelzebub. There is no danger of harmful discordance if the body, soul and mind are in perfect harmony. Yet, if a cause of discordance originates in any of these three planes, then the disharmony is communicated to the other planes. The being is not the physical body, nor the vital body that serves as a foundation for the organism's chemistry. It is not the sidereal body, which is the very root of our own desires, nor is it the mind, a marvelous organism whose physical instrument is the brain. The being is not the body of the consciousness, where all volitional, mental, or sentimental experiences are based. The being is something much more profound. Very rare are the human beings who have comprehended what the being is. The Glorian is the ray who strikes his bell when he comes into the physical world. The Glorian is the law and the incognito root of the human being. The Glorian is the being of the being. The Glorian is the law within us. When the human being obeys the law, the Glorian, he cannot become sick. Therefore, sickness comes because of disobedience to the law. When the seven bodies want to act separately as if they were seven eyes, sickness is the outcome. The physical and vital bodies must obey the soul. The soul must obey the innermost, and the innermost must obey the Glorian. 
body, soul, and spirit must convert themselves into a very pure and perfect universe through which the majesty of the Glorian can be expressed. Let us look at a concrete and simple example. If we throw stones into the water, then inevitably waves will be produced. These waves are the reaction of the water against the stones. If someone casts an offensive word against us, then we feel anger. So, anger is the reaction against the offensive word, and the consequences could be indigestion or a headache or simply a loss of energies, which will be the cause of a future sickness. If someone frustrates a plan we have projected, then we are filled with deep mental preoccupation. This preoccupation is the reaction of our mental body against the exterior incitement. No one doubts that a strong mental preoccupation brings sickness to the head. Therefore, we must govern our emotions with our thought. Thought must be governed by willpower and willpower by the consciousness. Then, we must open up our consciousness as when a temple is opened, in order for the priest, the innermost, to officiate at his altar, before the presence of God, the Glorian. We must dominate our seven vehicles and cultivate serenity in order for the sublime and ineffable majesty of the Glorian to be expressed through us. When all the acts of our daily life even the most insignificant acts become the living expression of the Glorian in us, we will then never be sick. Let us now study the five causes of sickness in successive order. Ends astrale. Master Paracelsus states, The stars from heaven do not form the human being. The human being comes from two principles, the ens seminis, the masculine sperm, and the ens virtutis, the innermost. Therefore, he has two natures, one corporeal and the other spiritual, and each one of them requires its digestion, womb, and nutrition. Just as the mother's uterus is the world that surrounds the child and also from where the fetus receives its nutrition. As well, nature, in its proper manner, is where the terrestrial body of the human being receives its influences that act upon his organism. This is the ens astrale, which is something that we do not see, yet, it contains us and all that is alive and has sensation. It is what the air contains and from which all elements live. We symbolize it with M, Mysterium. Paramirum liber. Here the great Theophastus, Paracelsus, clearly talks to us about the astral light of the Kabbalists, about the Azo and Magnesia of ancient alchemists, about the flying dragon of Medea, about Inri, of Christians and about the tarot of the Bohemians. The hour has arrived in which biosynosis must also study the great universal agent of life, the astral light and its solviti coagula, which are represented by the male goat of Mendez. The astral light is the basis for all sicknesses and the fountain of all life. Every sickness, every epidemic, has its astral larvae. When these larvae become coagulated in the human organism, a sickness is the outcome. In the Temple of Alden, the masters seat their patients in an armchair that is under yellow, blue, and red lights. These three primary colors serve in order to make the larvae of a sickness visible in the astral body. The masters treat the organism with innumerable medications after having extracted those larvae from the astral organism of the patient. When the astral body is healed, then mathematically the physical body will be healed, because before the physical atoms of an organ become sick, the internal atoms of the same organ are already sick. When the cause is cured, the effect is also cured. Every sick person can write a letter to the Temple of Alden. Thus, he, she, will receive help from the Gnostic medics. The letter should be handwritten by the sick person, then it should be burned by the same person. However, prior to this, the letter should be perfumed with frankincense in the very moment before burning it. The astral letter, or the soul of that burned letter, will go to the Temple of Alden. Hence, the Masters of Wisdom will read the letter and will assist the sick person. We must have our homes clean in the physical world as well as in the astral. Garbage deposits are always filled with infected larvae. There are odoriferous substances that burn the larvae or throw them out of our house. The frailgen is a Colombian plant that the Arhuaco Indians utilize in order to disinfect their homes. The disinfection can also be made with belladonna, camphor, and saffron. Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, sterilizes the sick person's room from microbes with a certain alchemical element. 
This element irradiates by means of a special system that impedes the microbes from reproducing themselves. Minerva also has a concave lens that she applies to the organ of the sick person. This establishes a focus of perennial magnetism that produces the cure. We must avoid having relationships with evil people, since these people are centers of astral infection. Ends Venery If a woman leaves her husband, then she is not free from him, neither is he free from her, since when a marital union is already established, this remains for the whole of eternity. Homunculus, Paracelsus Really, the human personality is contained within the semen, because the semen is the astral liquid of the human being. For this reason, every sexual union is indissoluble. The man who has sexual contact with a married woman remains in a permanent bond with part of the karma of her husband, for that reason. Fluidly, the two husbands of the woman remain connected by means of sex. When the semen falls outside of the womb, then because of its corrupted salts certain parasites are formed. These parasites adhere to the astral body of the one who created them. Thus, in this way, they absorb the life of their creators. The masturbating males engender succubi, and the masturbating females engender incubi. These larvae incite their creators to incessantly repeat the act of masturbation that gave them life. They have the same color as the air, therefore, they cannot be seen by simple sight. An efficacious remedy in order to liberate oneself from these larvae is to carry sulfur powder inside of our shoes. The ethereal vapors of the sulfur disintegrate them. When abandoning the physical body because of its death, the soul takes all of its conscious values. When reincarnating into a new physical body, the soul then brings all of its conscious values, they could be good as well as evil. These values are positive and negative energies. Every common and current human being has a culture of larvae in his astral atmosphere. These have such strange forms that are too odd to conceive of mentally. Positive values bring health and joy. Negative values materialize themselves into sicknesses and bitterness. Variola is the result of hatred. Cancer is the result of fornication. Lies disfigure the human figure thus engendering monstrous children. Egotism in its extreme produces leprosy. A person is born blind because of past cruelties. Tuberculosis is the daughter of atheism. Therefore, each human defect is venom for the organism. Ends a spiritual. The following strange story that we are going to recount happened in a town off the Atlantic coast of Colombia, which is known by the name of Dabulla. The majority of the dwellers there are of the black race. They were living indifferently and with indolence. One day, some years ago, natives of this locality robbed from the Arawako Indians their forefathers' sacred relics. Consequently, the Mama Miguel sent a commission to Dabolo with this. Following message, the Mama has consulted the Labrillo. Therefore, he knows that the sacred relics of our forefathers are here in this town. If you do not return them during the full moon, then the mama will send the animes and will burn down the town. This petition only caused mockery and laughter amongst the Dabulans. Upon the arrival of the full moon, without any known cause, a bonfire exploded in the town. When the neighbors assisted in suffocating it, new bonfires exploded, especially within the houses where the stolen relics were hidden. It seemed as if the potencies of fire had confabulated themselves against that defenseless town in order to convert it to ashes. Their Kuras, Catholic priests, chanted their exorcisms in vain and the people cried bitterly. Everything was in confusion. When they lost all hope of extinguishing the fires, the Dabolans resolved to immediately return the sacred relics to the Arawako Indians. Then, as if by magic, the bonfires ceased. What were the sources that the Mama used in order to produce the bonfires? Undoubtedly, they were the elementals of fire who are embodied within the plants, herbs, and roots that belong to the sign of fire. This knowledge is not only ignored by modern scientists, but also by those sects that say they are the possessors of esoteric teachings. When referring to the ends as spiritual, our expression has to be clear and our meaning precise because the ens espiritual is complex in its essence and in its accidents. When referring to the tattvas, 
which are forces of the elemental creatures of vegetables, we warn that they can be utilized by black magicians in order to harm their enemies. Each vegetable is a tattvic extract. What is a tattva? Much has been spoken about this matter, yet it has not been well comprehended. A tattva is a vibration of ether. Everything comes from ether, and everything returns to ether. Rama Prasit, the great Hindu philosopher, spoke about the tattvas. However, he did not teach how to work with them, because he did not know the wisdom of the tattvas in depth. H. P. Blavatsky wrote about the tattvas in her book The Secret Doctrine. Nevertheless, she did not know the esoteric technique that refers to the practical use of the tattvas. The whole universe is elaborated upon with the ethereal matter akash, this word is used by the Hindus. The ether disarranges itself into seven different modalities. When these modalities condense, then they give origin to all that is created. Sound is the materialization of akash. The sense of touch is the materialization of the Vayu Tattva. The fire and the light that we perceive through our eyes are the materialization of the Tejas Tattva. The sensation of taste is nothing more than the condensation of the Apas Tattva. The sense of smell is the materialization of the Prithvi Tattva. There are two other Tattvas that can only be handled by the magician. These are the Adi Tattva and the Samadhi Tattva. Akash is the primary cause of all that exists. Vayu is the cause of air and of motion. Tejas is the ether of the fire that animates the flames. Prithvi is the ether of the element earth that is accumulated within the rocks. Apas is the ether of the water that enters into action before Prithvi, because before the element earth appeared, there was water. The four elements of nature earth, fire, water, and air are merely condensations of fire. The four types of ether. These four varieties of ether are densely populated by innumerable elemental creatures of nature. The salamanders live within the fire, the Tejas Tattva. The Andines and Nereids live within the water, the Apas Tattva. The Sylphs live within the clouds, the Vayu Tattva. The Gnomes and Pygmies live within the earth, the Prithvi Tattva. The physical bodies of the salamanders are the plants, herbs, and roots of the vegetables that are influenced by the signs of fire. Influenced by the zodiacal signs of water. The physical bodies of the Sylphs. Elementals of the plants belonging to the are the signs of air. The physical bodies of the gnomes are the elementals of the plants under the influence of the zodiacal signs of earth. Therefore, when the Mama Miguel burned down the town of Dabola, he utilized the Tejas Tattva. The instruments used in order to operate with this Tattva were the elementals of fire, the salamanders, which are incarnated within the plants, trees, herbs, and roots of the zodiacal signs of fire. We can work with Appas in order to unleash the tempests or to pacify the waters by commanding the esoteric power of the plants of water. We can unleash or calm the winds and hurricanes by commanding the elementals of air who are enclosed within the vegetables of this zodiacal sign, Vayu. We can transmute lead into gold by commanding the esoteric power of the herbs belonging to the sign of earth, Prithvi. Yet, in order to perform this, we also need Tejas prehistoric traditions from the pre-Columbian Americas asseverate to us that the Indians worked the gold as if it was soft clay. They achieved this with the elementals of plants, whose ethereal elements are the tattvas. The black magicians utilize the elementals of plants and the tattvas in order to harm their neighbors from a distance. When the astral sylphs cross through space, they agitate Vayu. Thus, Vayu moves the masses of air. This is how wind is produced. The physical bodies of the Andines are when a magician moves the elementals, the elementals of the plants that are influenced of fire with his power. These elementals then act upon the Tejas Tapa by their own accord and the fire devours what this magician wants it to. Over the sea, great battles explode between the elementals. The Andines throw the ether of their waters against the sylphs. Consequently, the sylphs return this attack by casting ethereal waves against the Andines. Then, a tempest explodes from the agitated combination of water and air. The roar of the sea and the whistling of the hurricane are the shouts of war from these elementals. The elements of nature are agitated when the corresponding elementals become emotional, 
enthusiastic, or when they are intensely moved. We become owners of the tattvas and the powers that are enclosed within them by commanding the elementals of plants. The ethereal body, the vital body, of the human being is constituted of the tattvas, and we know that this body is the base upon which the organism's chemistry operates. Nowadays, official science and its treatises of physics cannot deny that the ether penetrates all of the physical elements. If the ethereal body is harmed, then mathematically the physical body is also harmed. So, by utilizing the vegetable elementals and their ethereal waves from a distance, the perverse entities can cause harm to the ethereal body. The consequences are very grave. The magician doctors of the Indian race, from the state of Bolivar, Colombia, test amongst themselves their science and power with the elemental of the guasimo tree, Guazuma Olmifolia Lamarck, in the following way, they make a circle around the guasimo tree, they bless it, venerate it, and beg its service, which is to attack the rival medic. After this ritual, with a new knife, they lift the bark of the tree a certain amount of centimeters and then place a piece of beef, lung meat, underneath it. They then command the elemental of the tree to attack their enemy. The rival does the same by utilizing another guasimo tree. Thus, in this way, a terrible fight ensues between the two elementals of these trees until one of the medics dies. The elemental of the guasimo tree is a genie of fire who impetuously lunges himself against the victim. Clairvoyantly seen, this elemental uses a cape that reaches to his feet, and he is endowed with great powers. The black magicians practice certain rites with the mastic tree, naturally. I keep the secret to myself, in order not to give weapons to the evil ones. Through these rites, they achieve the harm or murder of whomever they wish from a distance. In order to heal a sick person who has been attacked by this procedure, the white magician utilizes another mastic tree. The first thing he does is to incise the figure of the sick person on its trunk. He then makes a magical circle around the tree and commands the elemental to heal the sick person. In the same measure that the incision on the tree heals, so too does the sick person feel an improvement. When the scar disappears from the trunk of the tree, then the complete healing has been fulfilled. Two phenomena occur in the previous execution. First, transmission of life, mumia, occurs because the life of the elemental of the tree cures the sick person. Second, transplantation of sickness occurs because the sickness is transmitted into the aggressive vegetable plant and into the black magician. The black magician becomes sick in the same proportion that the patient becomes well. Many sicknesses can be cured from a distance with the procedure of the mastic tree. There are sorcerers who take advantage of certain plants that they mix with food in order to fill the organism of their victims with deadly worms, which produce sickness and death. Other sorcerers inject artificial gonorrhea into their victims, or they give them dangerous animal substances to drink in order to produce determined effects. The reader can inform himself in detail about all of these things in another section of this book. The black magicians know how to inject venomous substances into the astral body of their victims. Thus, inevitably they become sick. The astral body is a material organism a little bit less dense than the physical organism. In such cases, the masters give an emetic medicine to the astral body of the sick person in order for him to vomit the injected substances. The other internal bodies are also mate real. They too have their own particular sicknesses as well as their own medicines and their own medics. Therefore, surgical operations are not something rare in the Temple of Alden. A serious damage in the mental body, when reflectively transmitted in the physical brain, produces madness. A disconnection between the astral body and the mental body causes furious madness. If there is no adjustment between the astral body and the ethereal body, then the idiot or the cretin is the necessary outcome. In the Temple of Alden there is a very important laboratory of alchemy where the great master of medicine dwell, such as Hippocrates, Paracelsus, Galenus, Hermes, and others. This temple is in the astral plane, within the living innermost parts of great nature. The internal bodies eat, drink, assimilate, digest, and excrete in the same exact way as the physical organism does, because these are solely material bodies in a diverse degree of subtlety. 
These bodies utilize the tattvas in all sensations and reactions. The tattvas are the fundamental base of all that exists. They can be either vehicles of love or hatred. I regretfully have to disagree with the opinion of the master Wirakoka about the tattvic daytimer. In his tattvameter, he states that the five tattvas successively vibrate for two hour periods and that each tattva vibrates for 24 minutes in the following way. 1. Akash 2. Vayu 3. Tejas 4. Prithvi 5. Apas Huracoka asseverates that this vibration of the tattvas begins every day at sunrise. Yet, this is in discordance with the facts and observations. Therefore, the best tattvic daytimer is the one from nature. When the weather is cold, humid, rainy, and the sky is cloudy with dense, large, black clouds, this means that the cause is rooted in the tattva of the water, Appas. When this happens, the ethereal waves of the water are submitted to a very strong cosmic vibration that generally coincides with the position of the moon. During the hours or days of hurricanes and breezes, we can asseverate that the ethereal waves of the air, Vayu, are in agitation and vibration. The noon sky filled with sun clearly points out that the ether of fire, Tejas, is vibrating intensely. Dry, sultry weather elucidates for us the vibrations of Akash. The person traces a circle around the tree, then he blesses it. He begs the elemental to encircle his personal atmosphere. The hours filled with happiness, filled with light, are produced by Prithvi. Therefore, the best tattvic daytimer is the one from nature. When the waves of fire are agitated, then creation is inundated with light and heat. If the aqueous ether is vibrating, then the waters are moving and everything becomes humid. Nature becomes happy in its entirety when the ethereal waves of the element earth move and vibrate. The summer season can be forecast in the beginning of each year. The tradition of the Cabanulas is very ancient and is already forgotten and disfigured. The right procedure is as follows. During the night, on the 1st of January, collect 12 dry lumps of rocky salt. These must be separated into two groups of six. One month of the year has to be assigned to each lump of salt. Then, on the following day, the lumps must be observed. The dry ones represent the number of months for summer and the humid ones represent the number of months for winter. The black magicians as well as the white magicians equally utilize the tattvas of nature for their respective goals. There are certain tattvic extracts that the white magician takes advantage of in order to enclose himself. He closes his atomic atmosphere in order to defend himself from the potencies of evil. In this way, no malignant influence, magical venom, or work of witchcraft can affect or harm him. In the state of Magdalena, Colombia, there is a tree named Tomasuko. This tree is utilized in order to enclose oneself. This operation is performed on Good Friday at 12 o'clock midday. With the elemental's protective atoms, by creating a protector wall that will defend this person against tenebrous powers. Once this petition is made, the person approaches the tree walking from south to north and cuts one of the veins of the tree with a new knife. He then bathes his naked body with the life fluid of the tree. This fluid is very bitter, three cups of this liquid must be drunk. This tattvic extract protects us from many evils. No venom or any kind of witchcraft will harm those who are enclosed in this way. If a venomous liquid or a venomous substance is held in the magician's hand, a nervous shock will be felt by him. The genie of this tree will spin around the white magician in order to evade the entrance of the potencies of evil. When at a feast, the master Zanoni drank poisoned wine and while raising his cup, he said, I toast thee, O prince, even with this cup. The poison did not cause any harm to the master. History also tells us that Rasputin drank poisoned wine in the presence of his enemies, and he laughed at them. Ends Naturi What wires are to electricity, nerves are to vital fluid. The central nervous system is the throne of the innermost, spirit, and the grand sympathetic nervous system is the diocese of the astral body of the human being. As the sun sends all of its power to all the planets and lands, as well, the heart sends its spirit through the whole body. 
The moon, intelligence of the brain, upon hearing these affirmations, many medics of the official science will cry out, but where are those internal bodies? What do we do in order to identify and perceive them? We only accept what is analyzed in the laboratory and what is submitted to the studies of the systems that we have developed. In other words, the limit of their learning capacity is in relation with the apparatuses they have perfected. Therefore, the position in which they place themselves is absurd, that is to deny all that they cannot comprehend and to submit everything to the judgment of their five senses. If they were to develop their clairvoyance, which is the sixth sense, they then would be aware of the truth concerning this assertion. One must not forget that the luminaries, intellectuals, from the epoch of Pasteur mocked him when he affirmed his famous theories, which later made him a celebrity. Did this not also occur, to a far worse degree, with Copernicus and Galileo when they became victims of what was believed to be opposed to the known or revealed truth? Was it not the wise ones who smeared Columbus with slanders because he announced the existence of a new world beyond the cove of Finisterre, which was then believed to be the end of the earth? The sixth sense can be awakened with the following procedure. For a period of ten minutes every day seat yourself at a table, then fixedly look at the water contained in a glass. With this daily practice, in time clairvoyance will finally awaken. The vowel I, pronounced like the vowel sound found in the word B, when vocalized daily for one hour, will produce the same results. Hence, clairvoyance will awaken, and the internal bodies will be seen, and their anatomy can be studied. Goes into the heart and returns into the brain. The fire, heat, has its origin in the chemical activity of the organs, the lungs, yet it penetrates the whole body. The vital liquor, vital essence, is universally distributed as it moves, circulates in the body. This effluvium contains many different effluviums and produces various types of metals, virtues and defects, in it. Paramyrum L. Paracelsus When the ethereal body of the human being is weakened, then by the action of reflection the physical organism becomes sick. The ethereal body has its physical center in the spleen. The solar energies, which are the vital principle of everything that exists, enter through the spleen into our physical organism. The ethereal body is an exact duplicate of the physical body, and it is made up of tattvas. Each ethereal atom penetrates into each physical atom and an intense vibration is produced. All of the chemical processes of the organism are developed based on the ethereal body or second organism. Every organ of the physical body becomes sick when its ethereal counterpart has become sick, when the ethereal body is healed the physical body is healed as well. The disciples who cannot remember their astral experiences must submit their ethereal body to a surgical operation that the Nirmanakas perform in the first hall of Nirvana, the first subplan of Nirvana referred to in Theosophy. After this operation, the disciple can take into his astral travels the ethers that he needs in order to bring back his memories. The ethereal body is composed of four ethers, chemical ether, ether of life, luminous ether, and reflective ether. The chemical ether and ether of life serve as a source for the manifestation of the forces that work in the biochemical and physiological processes and in all that is related to the reproduction of the races. Light, heat, color, and sound identify themselves with the luminous and reflective ethers. The sapient soul expresses herself within these two ethers. She is the beloved maiden of our memories. When seen clairvoyantly, this maiden looks like a beautiful lady within the ethereal body. It is necessary for the disciple to learn how to take the beloved maiden of our memories into his astral travels in order to bring the memory of all that he sees and hears within the internal worlds. She serves as a mediator between the senses of the physical brain and the ultrasensible senses of the astral body. It comes to be, if the concept fits, that she is like the storage space of memory. While in bed, at the time of sleep, invoke your innermost in the following way. Father of mine, thou who art my real being, I beseech thee with all of my heart and with all of my soul to take the beloved maiden of my memories out from my ethereal body with the goal of not forgetting anything when returning into my physical body. Then, while becoming sleepy pronounce the mantras. Lara, S. The letter S must have a high-pitched and sharp sound, 
similar to that produced by air brakes. When the disciple finds himself between vigil and dreaming, then he has to get up from his bed, leave his room and travel to the Gnostic Church. This last action must be done with confidence and faith, because it is real and not fictitious. Neither mentalism nor suggestion exist in this practice. You must get up very carefully from your bed, so as not to wake yourself. Then, you must leave your room by walking as naturally as you do when you travel daily to your job. Before leaving your room, you must perform a little jump with the intention of floating. If you float, then direct yourself towards the Gnostic Church or to the house of the sick person whom you need to heal. Yet, if you do not float when performing the little jump, then return to your bed and repeat the experiment. During this practice, do not worry about your physical body. Let nature take care of it and do not doubt, because if you do, the experiment will be lost. The brain has a very fine tissue that is the physical vehicle for astral memories. When this tissue is damaged, the memories are unattainable. This wound can only be healed within the Temple of Alden by means of the healing powers of the Masters. The seminal canals have certain atoms that typify our past reincarnations. These atoms are also the bearers of our inheritance and illnesses that we suffered in our past lives, as well as the sicknesses suffered by our forefathers. The germinal cell of the spermatozoid is septuple in its internal constitution and through it we receive the biological and psychological inheritance from our parents. Our character and talent are an exclusive patrimony of the ego. Therefore, they separate themselves from the atavistic current. There is a hospital or healing house within the heart of the sun where opportune assistance is granted to many disincarnated initiates in order to cure their internal bodies. The aura of an innocent child is a panacea for sick mental bodies. Thus, People who suffer from mental sicknesses will find great relief by sleeping close to an innocent child. Also, smudgings done with the smoke of toasted corn are very calm mendable. The sick person must keep his stomach free from gases in order to avoid the ascension of them towards the brain and causing major derangement. Castor oil is very commendable for people who are sick in their minds. This oil must be applied daily to the head. Vaccinations must be restricted in all cases, because they damage the astral body of people. If you wish to receive the help of the Master's Paracelsus, Hippocrates, Galenus, Hermes, etc., then you must write a letter to the Temple of Alden and ask for their medical attention. The Tattvas intensely vibrate and palpitate with the impulse of the elemental populace and with the influence of the stars. The Tattvas and the elementals from the plants are the basis of esoteric medicine. Purulent tumors in the fingers can generally be cured by alternately submerging the affected part within hot and cold water. When the action of the heat and of the cold, Tathas Tejas and Apas, establishes organic equilibrium, then normality is reattained. Every human being carries an atmosphere of ancestral atoms that has its chakras in the knees. Therefore, it is in our knees where the instinct for survival is located, as well as the inheritance of race. This is why the knees shake when we face grave danger. Ends day. H. P. Blavatsky states, Karma is the unerring law which adjusts effect to cause on the physical, mental, and spiritual planes of being. As no cause remains without its due effect from greatest to least, from a cosmic disturbance down to the movement of your hand, and as like produces like, karma is that unseen and unknown law which adjusts wisely, intelligently, and equitably each effect to its cause, tracing the latter back to its producer. Though itself unknowable, its action is perceivable. Key to theosophy karma is paid in this physical world and also in the internal worlds. However, the karma in this physical world, as grave as it might be, is much sweeter than its astral equivalent. Presently, in the Avicii, hell, of the black moon, there are millions of human beings who are paying terrible karmas. The mind of the magician becomes horrified when contemplating Lucifer, who is submerged within ardent fire and sulfur. The mind of the magician becomes terrified when contemplating the famous inquisitors from the Middle Ages, who are suffering in the fire they made others once endure, and who are exhaling the same painful woes they once made others exhale. 
The soul of the magician shakes with horror when contemplating the great tyrants of war who suffer their terrible karmas in the black moon. There we see Hitler and Mussolini suffering the martyrdom of the fire they unleashed over defenseless cities. When the innermost and the soul obey the law, which is their own law, then the result is joy, happiness, and perfect health. The day will arrive in which we will liber aid ourselves from the universes and from the gods. This will occur when we are fused with our Glorian, which is the law within us. It is the quest of the soul to laboriously climb the septenary ladder of light in order to pass beyond light and darkness. The soul has to pass fifty doors in order to unite herself with the Glorian. The following is copied from a Gnostic ritual. Up above, in the unknown heights, there is a palace. The floor of that palace is of gold, lapis lazuli, and jasper. Yet, in the middle of everything blows a breath of death. Woe to thee, O warrior, O fighter, if your servant succumbs, yet there are remedies and remedies. I know of those remedies, because of the yellow and the blue which surrounds thee is seen by me. To love thee is best, it is the most sublime. And delectable nectar. This fragment from a Gnostic ritual of Huericoca, which was profaned by Israel Rojas R, conceals great esoteric truths. That magnificent palace of fifty doors has beautiful and sweet gardens, within which a breath of death blows. In its rooms we will be loved by our most beloved disciples, yet we also will be sold and betrayed by those same disciples. Those who applauded and admired us will abandon us. Thus, in the end we will be alone. Nevertheless, in essence, we will never truly be alone, nor accompanied, but in perfect plenitude. The human being will convert himself into one law when he is united with the law. Genuine Powers and Inherited Powers Genserbo, the great sorcerer, narrated to me how he inherited the esoteric powers of his grandmother, who was an old Spanish lady. Genserbo said the following, My grandmother instructed to me how I could attend to her when she was on her deathbed. She acknowledged that I was going to be the heir of her power. So, when I left my home one day, the old lady entered into a state of agony but could not die, she asked my relatives to call me. When I returned home, I comprehended everything, and I understood that this was the supreme moment. I then rolled my pants up to my knees in order to tolerate the terrible coldness of that deliverance of power. Alone, I entered into her habitat of death. I held my grandmother's hand, then the fire which was illuminating this dreadful abode went out. Then, a crystal glass filled with water fell, and yet the water did not disperse. Finally, the old lady exhaled her last breath and left within my hand an enormous, terribly cold, and stiff spider. That spider submerged itself inside the pores of my hands. This is how I inherited the grandmother, power of my this narrative, which is as I heard it from the lips of Ganserbo the sorcerer, clearly demonstrates inherited powers. Subsequent investigations into the case of Ganserbo brought us to the conclusion that this was related with powers of black magic. The spider in question is a female black magician who has lived by adhering to the astral body of all the forefathers of Ganserbo. This female black magician likes to assume the horrible figure of a spider, because the astral body is elastic and can assume any animal figure. Ganserbo is a great diviner, and nothing can be hidden from him. Yet, in essence, he is nothing more than an unconscious medium. If it is true that he knows the secrets of all the world, this is only due to the internal information that he receives from that female black magician who has adhered to his astral body, as she was adhered to the astral body of his grandmother. The lost word is another power that in the moment of his death th. Death the master delivers to his disciple. The lost word of the black magicians is written mathram and they pronounce it mazram. The lost word of the white magicians is kept hidden within the luminous and spermatic fiat of the first instant and is only known by the initiate. No one has uttered it. No one will utter it, except the one who has incarnated it. The Gnostic Church The Gnostic Church is the authentic Church of our Lord the Christ. It is the temple of initiations, and it is situated within the astral plane. Our Lord the Christ and the Holy Masters officiate there. 
Whosoever reads our books and practices sexual magic will be internally connected with this temple. The disciple can also go there with his body of flesh and bones any time he wishes to do so. This can be done by practicing the procedure that I teach in Chapter 5, Humans and Lands in Jin State. On Fridays and Sundays, the disciple can assist the preacher in order to receive the holy unction of bread and wine, and in order to be cured of any sicknesses. This church has 11,000 vestals. The twenty and four elders of the Apocalypse, Revelation, dwell there. This church has esoteric instruction rooms for the disciples, in which the masters teach and instruct. Whosoever wants to be united with his own innermost necessarily has to pass through the nine arcades of the nine initiations of minor mysteries. The aspirants of each initiation have rooms for their esoteric instruction. Each initiation has its degrees, and each degree its ordeals. The human being is united with his innermost in the high initiation. This is how he is converted into a master of major mysteries, read my book The Perfect Matrimony. The masters of the holy Gnostic Church come to the bedside of the sick in order to heal them. There is a Gnostic prayer that every sick person must pronounce in order to ask the masters for help. Behold the prayer. Gnostic Prayer O Thou, Solar Logos, Igneous Emanation, Substance and Consciousness of Christ, Powerful Life whereby everything advances, come unto me and penetrate me, enlighten me, bathe me, go through me and awak and within my being all of those ineffable substances that are as much a part of Thee as a part of me. Universal and Cosmic Force, Mysterious Energy, I conjure Thee, come unto me, remedy my affliction, Cure me from this illness and put apart from me this suffering so I can have harmony, peace, and health. I ask thee in thy sacred name, which the mysteries in the Gnostic Church have taught me, so thou can make vibrate with me all of the mysteries of this plane and superior planes, and that all of those forces together may achieve the miracle of my healing. So be it. The Gnostic Church is especially concerned with sex. Mistaken are all those who think that the nonsensical practices of theosophy, the Rosicrucian order, or spiritism are necessary in order to be a Gnostic. Let all Tyrians and Trojans know that there are no abnormal people in our church. Thus, whosoever wants to be a Gnostic has to live a sane and equilibrated life. There are decrepit old women and sexually exhausted old men who criticize us because we love sacred sex. Those fornicating elders and sanctimonious old women do not belong to the Gnostic Church, because the Gnostic movement especially studies love, and is founded upon the sexual force. The force with which God made the universe. Abnormal individuals are everywhere, those who boast of themselves because they have mediumistic faculties, through which are expressed certain larvae that pollute the astral plane. Those individuals say that they receive messages from our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, they found lodges and associate IS with decrepit and ignorant old men. With their lack of respect for the most great and sublime being who came into the world, they have reached the breaking point as impostors. When we, the Gnostics, enter into the Church of Christ, which is the holy Gnostic Church, how difficult it is to attain the privilege of only touching the tassel of the sandals of the Master. What a difficult and laborious task it is to have the right of kissing the feet of His Divine Majesty, our Lord the Christ. Nevertheless, the mediums, channelers, are those who, cheated by astral larvae, say that they have communication with the solar logos, the Christ. What dim-witted individuals! Let us put ourselves aside from the spiritists and let us advance upon the theme. What is important is for a man to learn how to love, how to adore the woman, how to delight in the joy of sex without spilling the semen, without reaching the orgasm. Man was made for the woman, and vice versa, the woman for the man. Male and female sexually unite, with the divine difference of not ejaculating the semen, without reaching the orgasm, by learning how to withdraw in time, this separates them from the brutish ones. So, just as there are canals for spilling the semen, so are there canals for its transmutation, in order to upsurge it to the head in the human organism. It is necessary to learn how to use these ascending canals, to learn how to handle the snake, and to snatch the passionate beast. There is the need to exchange passion for force, for power. Preparation and Discipline of the Gnostic Doctor
Rules for the Gnostic Medic 1. It is forbidden for the Gnostic doctor to eat any type of meat. 2. It is totally forbidden for the Gnostic doctor to fornicate. 3. Every Gnostic doctor must be saintly. 4. Every Gnostic doctor must be clean of vices. 5. Every Gnostic doctor must be married. 6. Every Gnostic doctor is obliged to practice sexual magic daily in order to awaken the Kundalini. 7. Every Gnostic doctor must practice daily the exercises of esoteric meditation and vocalization. 8. The Gnostic doctor must possess infinite charity and infinite sweetness. 9. The Gnostic doctor can only practice sexual magic with his priestess. Spouse slash her priest spouse. 10. The Gnostic doctor can never be adulterous. Meditation. When the Gnostic doctor submerges himself into meditation, he does it because he looks for information. Meditation covers three facets. 1. Concentration. 2. Meditation. 3. Adoration. Meditation awakens the internal powers and converts the student into a magician. Concentration means to fix the mind only on one subject matter. Meditation means to internally reflect upon the same subject matter. Adoration means to converse with the same subject matter or object of our consent ration, to live in it, in the subject matter upon which we have fixed the mind. The mind must be placed apart from the world then after, it has to enter into the Buddhic consciousness in order to meditate. The mind must be fixed upon the consciousness in order to be illuminated. When the Gnostic medic meditates, focusing upon a tree, he is searching for information from the elemental of that tree. He wants to know what this tree is for, what properties it possesses, etc. The Gnostic medic receives information during meditation. The best hour for meditation is the one in which we feel sleepy. The Gnostic medic will have to practice internal meditation daily. We achieve the awakening of the consciousness and the actualization of all our esoteric powers with the technique of meditation, sexual magic, and the power of the verb. One hour of daily vocalization is worth more than reading a thousand books of Oriental Theosophy. True vocalization is intimately related with the technique of meditation. The syllable ain is related with the tatvatagus, the principle of the fire. The syllable ain is related with the cosmic mind, of which our mental body is only a fragment. The syllable own is related with Atman Bodhi, the purely spiritual world, which is the homeland of the innermost. The syllable own is related with the great universal womb, the Archaeus of the Greeks, the astral light of the Kabbalists, the super soul of Emerson, Aleya. The syllable on is related with the tatva veu, the principle of movement. The syllable in makes the hypothesis and epiphysis glands vibrate. Thus, the sixth sense called clairvoyance is acquired. The syllable in makes the thyroid gland and the atoms of the mental body vibrate. Thus, the human being acquires the esoteric ear and the clairvoyance of the mental body. The syllable own makes our buddhic, mystical, or intuitive buddhic consciousness vibrate. We all have longings for liberation. We all possess that longing that in the far east is called bodhamanda, the fundamental base of knowing. Every purusha, innermost, yearns for his soul to follow the path of liberation, or dharma. The doctrine of the heart is Buddha, the Christic consciousness. The vehicle of the Christic consciousness has its chakra in the heart. So, when internally vocalizing the syllable own and meditating on its profound significance, the awakening of the mystical consciousness is produced. Then, independent from the physical body, the soul acquires the power of functioning in her superior vehicles. The awakening of the consciousness, or Buddha, expresses itself as the eye of Dangma, the intuition that allows us to know without the necessity of reasoning. The syllable own also makes the testicles' hormones vibrate, thus transmuting the semen into Christic energy. This clearly shows that the awakening of the consciousness, Buddha, can only be achieved by practicing sexual magic, by internally vocalizing and becoming skillful in the astral. Since the consciousness, Buddha, is enclosed within our own crestos. The astral body is the mediator between the soul and the innermost. 
Thus, it is only in this astral mediator region where our monad can be liberated. Here is where all of the initiations are verified. Buddha, the mystical consciousness, has to express itself through our astral body in order to perform the truth, which is buddhi, and which is truly the innermost or Atman within us. This mystical consciousness, Buddha, cannot express itself through the physical body or stola sarira, but only through the astral body. Because the astral body is the mediator between the mystical consciousness and the physical body. When the human being spills the semen, reaches the orgasm, he loses millions of solar atoms that are then replaced by millions of demonic atoms from the very infernos of the human being. This produces a tenebrous obscurity within the astral body. When the human being accomplishes the following formula, which is to introduce the virile member into the feminine vagina, and to withdraw without spilling the semen, without reaching the orgasm, then the solar atoms multiply in an extraordinary manner and return into the astral body. Hence, they fill the astral body with light and solar fire. Only in this way can the Buddha, the Christic consciousness, express itself through the astral body. Finally, the soul and the innermost become united forever, thus bringing about the final liberation. The human being becomes clairvoyant by meditating on the syllable in and on the great universal fire. The human being acquires mental clairvoyance and the esoteric ear by meditating on the syllable ain and the universal mind. The awakening of the consciousness and the development of intuition are acquired by meditating daily upon our innermost and on the syllable own, and by practicing sexual magic daily. The power of telepathy is acquired by meditating on the syllable un and the solar plexus. The power to remember our past lives is acquired by meditating on the syllable on and on the birth and death of vegetables and of all things. The clue of pranav, or the science of mantras, is found within the consciousness. The waves of the consciousness nourish the mind. The mantras must be felt, since all of their powers reside within the superlative functions of the consciousness. Therefore, before vocalizing the mantras, we must live them within the mystical consciousness. In, ain, on, bun, on must be vocalized daily for one hour. The five vowels e, 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 o, u, uh, make the chakras, discs, or magnetic wheels of our astral body vibrate. Thus, with the vibration, the tattvas are transmuted into hormones, since each chakra is a regulator of our endocrine glands. These glands are truly biogenetic laboratories, whose mission is to transmute the tattvas into hormones. The waves of the consciousness bring together all of the connected and harmonious thoughts in order to fortify them. Everything exists by Aum, everything lives by Aum, and everything comes into existence by Aum. Yet, in the beginning, only the divine chaos existed. The vowel A ah is the prime matter of the great work, it is the tattva of everything that comes into existence. The vowel U is the mystical consciousness, or the collective mystical consciousness. The vowel M, the M in esotericism is also a vowel, is the incessant transformation and existence that the gods create with their mind. Let us clarify this in order to have greater comprehension. The earth in its nebulous state was ah. Then, in its processes of gestation or formation directed by the cosmic consciousness it was u. Finally, when populated by all types of living beings it was m. The embryonic germ in its first days within the maternal womb is ah. The fetus while in gestation is U. The very welcome child coming into existence is M. Aum is lived by the animal. Aum is lived by the human being. Aum is esoterically pronounced Aum, as described below. The power of all the tattvas is enclosed within this mantra. The Kabbalistic number of Aum is 666, and not the number 10 as the black magician Cherenzi taught. In order for Aum to completely manifest itself through us, we have to prepare all of our seven vehicles. Aum contains the seven notes of the musical scale, which correspond to the seven cosmic planes and to our seven bodies. The seven words of Calvary, pronounced by Jesus, give us power over the seven cosmic planes. In order for the mystical consciousness, Buddha, to express itself as intuition through us, we have to prepare our seven bodies by means of sexual magic. Before self-realizing the mantra Aum, 
We have to live the mantra ee a o. Sexual magic is ee a o. The kundalini is ee a o. The formula in order to awaken the kundalini lies exclusively in the sexual act. To introduce the virile member into the feminine vagina and withdraw without spilling the semen, without reaching the orgasm. This is our axiomatic prescription for all Gnostic students. During these sexual trances, the mantra e e a o must be vocalized. Then meditation on the fire and on the innermost must be performed. Aum is pronounced by opening the mouth very well with the vowel a, rounding it with the u, and closing it with the m. The Gnostic medic needs to submit himself to these rules for the wise exercise of holy Gnostic medicine. The Gnostic medic must be a magician in order to command the elementals of vegetables. The Kundalini. Kundalini is the fire of the Holy Spirit. Kundalini is a liquid fire of a purely spiritual nature. Kundalini is the igneous serpent of our magical powers. Kundalini is found enclosed within a membranous pouch that is nourished by the rays of the sun and of the moon. This membranous pouch is found concentrated within the coccygeal bone. The fire of the Holy Spirit and the Kundalini are the same. The difference between the Kundalini and the Holy Spirit is just a circumstance of names. In the East, the sexual force is called Kundalini, and in the West, it is called the Holy Spirit. Yet, it is the same sexual fire. Enclosed within the membranous pouch in the coccyx, the secret in order to awaken the kundalini, the fire of the Holy Spirit, lies in the following prescription: Introduce the virile member into the feminine vagina, then withdraw without spilling the semen, without reaching the orgasm. This is what is called sexual magic, and it is mandatory for the Gnostic medic to practice sexual magic daily in order to transmute his semen into divine energy. Thus. The fire of the Holy Spirit or Kundalini awakens with this prescription, because this fire rips open the membranous pouch in which it is enclosed. Then it ascends upwards through a canal situated within the spinal medulla. In the East, this canal is called Shashamna. That canal remains closed in ordinary people. However, the seminal vapors open it and expose it, so that the Kundalini can enter through its inferior orifice. In order to ascend upwards through a thread situated in the center of this canal, the opening of the orifice of this canal of Shashamna is performed under the direction of an angelic atom, which is situated in the semen. This fine thread through which the Kundalini ascends is very delicate. If the Gnostic medic does not withdraw himself before the orgasm, if he indeed arrives at the spilling of the semen, then this thread is ripped. It becomes a burned fuse or burned wire. And the kundalini descends one or more canyons, vertebrae, according to the magnitude of the fault. In Gnosticism, we call the spinal vertebrae canyons or pyramids. Each canyon is related with certain esoteric powers. There are thirty-three spinal canyons. When the kundalini fire has already risen through the thirty-three canyons, then within the astral plane, the staff of the patriarchs is delivered to the Gnostic. High initiation is received when the staff of the patriarchs has been received. High initiation is the fusion of the spiritual soul with the innermost. The spiritual soul is the buddhic or intuitive body. When the buddhic body is fused with the sacrum, innermost, then a new heavenly man, a new master is born. This new master has to take out his psychic extracts, which are enclosed within his vital, astral, mental, and causal bodies. This task is really very difficult, and this is performed by means of the fire of the kundalini. The first psychic extract that has to be patiently drawn out is the ethereal extract. That extract is called a ransa. The master has to awaken the kundalini in his ethereal body, vital body, just as he did in his physical body. Once the master has patiently made his kundalini rise upwards through the spinal column of his ethereal body. Then this master achieves the removal of his psychic extract that is enclosed within his ethereal body. Next, that extract is assimilated within his buddhic body or spiritual soul. This is how the master acquires the power over the tattvas, which will allow him to govern the four elements of nature. Difficult labor of the very awakening the kundalini in the ethereal body and making it rise upwards, canyon after canyon, 
just as it was done in the physical body, is performed under the direction of a specialist. Aransa is the name of the Sai Sheik extract of the ethereal body. Therefore, Aransa is the mantra the new master must vocalize in order to awaken his kundalini and to make it rise upwards through the spinal column of his ethereal body. Aransa can only be pronounced by the masters, yet I have written it in this book in order for it to be a guide to the new masters who with my teachings will be born. Coccyx Once the ethereal extract is liberated, the master has to perform analogous labors with the astral, mental, and causal bodies in a successive order. All of these psychic extracts must be assimilated by the internal master. In order for him to become self-realized in depth, and to have the complete right to enter into nirvana. Then, when reaching this degree, the master is an omnipotent god, a majesty of fire, a sovereign of creation in its entirety. This is the science of the serpent. The buddhic body. The buddhic body is the diamond soul of the innermost. The buddhic body is the superlative and ennobling consciousness of our being. The buddhic body is the spiritual soul of the being. Thus, when the innermost is fused with his spiritual soul, the heavenly man, the master, is born. The buddhic body or spiritual soul has his diocese within the heart. Thus, the heart temple is the diocese of what is most dignified and decent within our being. The fires of the heart control the kundalini. The kundalini, the fire of the Holy Spirit, rises under the control of the fires of the heart. The ascent of the kundalini depends upon the merits of the heart. The path of the heart is the path of the innermost. Therefore, the path of the heart opens up for us only with sanctity. We receive the cross of the initiation within the heart temple. We live the Golgotha within the heart temple. The infinite universe is a system of hearts. Therefore, the path of sanctity is the path of the heart. The diamond soul or buddhic body must receive the five stigmata and be totally Christified in order to fuse itself with the innermost. The Gnostic medic must follow the path of sanctity in order to self-realize himself in depth. The path of initiation. 1. There are eight initiations of major mysteries and nine initiations of minor mysteries. 2. To reach the great initiations of major mysteries is impossible without having passed through the nine initiations of minor mysteries. 3. I am very deeply sorry that certain spiritualist societies do not know how to interpret the maximum sacrifice of the martyr of Golgotha. 4. Samael on Vaor, master of the Venerable White Lodge, is indeed very sorry that the students of certain secret societies never talk about the nine initiations of minor mysteries. 5. I declare that when arriving at the degree of a Sika, or Hierophant of the fifth initiation of major mysteries, the following seven paths are opened before the Master. A. To continue with humanity, working for humanity. B. To continue within the internal planes as Nirmanakya, working for humanity. C. To join the evolution of the angels or Devas. D. To form part of the Logos. Of the government. E to prepare the work of the future ethereal age of the earth. F. To enter into the ineffable joy of nirvana. G. To perform superior works of nirvana. Samael on Vaor declares that he was the first human being in the world to publicly deliver to humanity the secrets of initiation. If the reader of this book wants to enter onto the path of initiation right now, then let him study and totally live my two books entitled The Perfect Matrimony and The Revolution of Beelzebub. All of the secrets of the initiation are found in these two books. The Seven Serpents We have seven bodies and seven serpents. Each one of our seven bodies has its own medulla and its own serpent. These seven serpents are the seven degrees of the power of the fire, two groups of three plus the sublime coronation of the seventh serpent that joins us with the One, with the Law, with the Father. These are the seven portals and the seven great initiations of major mysteries, read Zodiacal Course by the same author. The Cones The Cones are seven, and they work under the influence of the seven planetary rays in our terrestrial evolution. Let us know them. The Mahakahan, the Divine Hierarch, directs the works of the White Lodge. All the archives of terrestrial evolution are in his power. 
The Manu is another divine being who has to form new races. There are various manus. When a Manu lays the foundation of a new race and ends his work, then he receives the eighth initiation of major mysteries with the degree of Buddha Pratika, which signifies solitary Buddha. Then, after his eighth major initiation, much later on, he achieves the degree of Lord of the World. The eighth initiation of major mysteries is granted in the most divine planes of consciousness. The fact that I have previously spoken of five initiations of major mysteries and now I come to speak of nine will appear contradictory to many people. Therefore, I must clarify myself, we fulfill our human evolution with the five initiations of major mysteries. The remaining three initiations and the degree of Lord of the World are of a superhuman nature. Now, beloved reader, do you want to know the formula in order to convert yourself into a god? This is the formula, introduce the virile member into the feminine vagina, then withdraw without spilling the semen, without reaching the orgasm. This is the clue in order for you to convert yourself into a god. Yet, to become a perfect saint is an indispensable requirement for you. e a o is the mantra that must be vocalized during the daily trance of sexual magic. Second Guardian We have said that the mind lives constantly reacting against the impact of the exterior world. On previous pages we have explained that these reactions of the mind depart from the center out to the periphery. The mental center from where these reactions of understanding depart is a terribly demonic mental creature. This creature is the guardian of the threshold of the mental body. This mental guardian enslaves the mind of all human beings. All of those reactions of hatred, rage, violence, egotism, etc. emerge from him. The Arhat must despoil himself of this horrible guardian in order to convert his mind matter into Christ mind. This labor is performed by means of fire. When the igneous serpent of the mental body reaches the spinal vertebra that corresponds to the igneous wings, then the Arhat must courageously confront this tenebrous creature and defeat it in a terrible fight, hand to hand. Thus, after that instant, the mind of the Arhat only obeys the direct commands of the innermost. Another life similar to the present one is lived within the world of the mind. Therefore, it is not strange that in the world of the mind the competent investigators find humanity dedicated to similar labors as to those of the physical world. The black magicians from the world of the mind are terribly dangerous. The Arhat has to courageously confront them and defeat them with the sharp edge of his sword. The guardian of the threshold of the mind is the second guardian who crosses us on our path. Theurgy Baths with plants to prepare the body for magic. The first thing that the magician must do in order to put practical magic into effect is to transcend his body. The body of a magician has a vibratory tonality that is totally different from that of the ordinary human being. In ancient times, all the powers of the goddess of nature were totally expressing themselves through the chakras of the human organism. Hence, the human being was a complete magician. In this day and age, humanity has totally separated itself from nature and has accommodated itself to an artificial life. Therefore, the human body now does not reflect the powers of nature. It does not matter if a musician is very ingenious. If his instrument is unsatisfactory or defective, then he will not execute his composition with success. Yet, if he tunes and corrects the instrument, then he will perform with it the most beautiful melodies. A similar case occurs with the human body that is unsatisfactory. Therefore, in order for it to reflect the powers that the goddess Mother Nature confers to us, it is necessary to prepare it for the exertion of practical magic. Esoteric works for our neighbor. Esoteric works for our neighbor are performed with the genii from the stars, with the elementals from nature, and with the magic eye. The magician's magic eye is his innermost. For example, if we want to join an enamored couple in wedlock, we must beg our innermost in order that he, in his turn, will beg Uriel. If Uriel allows this petition, then we will work with Uriel and with the elementals from nature. Yet, if the petition to this genie from Venus is not accepted, then we have no other choice but to prostrate ourselves before the verdict of the law, because the law must not be violated. Read the chapter entitled, Astrothergy and Medicine.
While in meditation we can visit the heart temples of the stars, because through meditation we can achieve being completely within the innermost. In other words, we can completely become the superior I. Who is the magic I? We can also visit the sidereal temples in our astral bodies. The white magician does not violate the law. Whosoever performs magical works without permission of his innermost and against the will of the divine hierarchies is a black magician who will pay his karma within the abyss. Evil Eye on Children I know of an unusual clinic in the town of San Luis de Cucuta. In a very ancient, large, colonial-style house, an old lady lives who knows how to cure the evil eye. This house is always filled with mothers who carry their children in their arms so that this old lady can cure them from that sickness. A certain person's child became sick and naturally this person took the child to the official physicians in order for them to prescribe a remedy for the child. The physician's opinion was that the child was suffering from a stomach infection. Therefore, they prescribed him to fast and to drink boiled water as the only nourishment. Also, they prescribed him some powdered medicine within slips of paper and some liquid medicine, etc. The result from all of this was worse. The child acquired great rings under his eyes. As well, fever, vomiting, and diarrhea were afflicting him. Someone advised the child's father to take his sick son to that old woman's unusual clinic. So, when the old woman saw the child, she exclaimed, an evil eye was placed on this child, which was caused by the sight of Mr. XX. Then, she added, This child needs to be whispered to. She took the little child in her arms and entered into her private room. The child was crying and screaming horribly. The child's father became very worried while listening to the weeping of his son. Yet, some people advised him by saying, You must not be afraid because the evil eye will leave the child through his weeping. You will see. Meanwhile, the old lady with the child in her arms appeared again in the room. The child was already healed. The old lady spoke and said, Your son is already healthy. Two more whisperings and not even the roots of the evil eye will remain within him. Now you must bathe him in solar charged water within which you must place a piece of gold jewelry and a carnation. The result was astonishing because the child became totally healed. This old lady performed what all of those scoundrel-like impostors from the official medicine cannot do. Another interesting case is the following. A certain child of a physician from Kukuda became sick. That physician prescribed medicine by spoons, slips of papers, etc. to his own son. Yet, in spite of all this pharmacopoeia, the sickness became worse. The worried physician resolved to call a reunion of physicians in order to search for a solution to this problem. However, all the remedies and all the theories of these physicians and his colleagues failed. Then, the physician's wife, a little bit more intuitive, resolved to take her child to this old woman. The result was astonishing. When seeing the child, the old lady said, the child has received an evil eye. Thus, the old lady whispered to the child, and she healed him. The physician's wife told her husband what had happened and the physician himself paid the old lady for what is curious in this case is that the mentioned physician kept in silence all that had happened. He never publicly spoke or wrote about it. This is because the false apostles of medicine feel shame when talking about these things. They are afraid to fall into ridicule. They are afraid of being qualified as sorcerers by the crowd. This is how thousands of sick people die in the hands of these foolish scientists on a daily basis. Formula in order to cure the evil eye. Obtain leaves of officium, leaves of guandal, cajanus indicus spring, materiton, gliricidia sepium jack. Stood. These branches must be cooked in water and the child must be bathed in this decoction. The sick child is cured with three daily baths. I know the case of a certain gentleman who has a terrible hypnotic power. It is enough for him to stare at a child and this child dies 24 hours later. That gentleman is conscious of his power. Therefore, he always avoids staring at children. This occurs because the ethereal body of the child is more defenseless. Hence, it can be easily hurt by the hypnotic power of the people who have that power very well developed. 
reading from the four Gospels depurates and cleanses the aura of people. Therefore, there are many Coranderos who cure these cases by reciting from the four Gospels and blessing the child with the sign of the cross. Coral, gold, and jet, hard, black variety of lignite, assist the children against the evil eye. Cases of Psychic Possession The Bible describes innumerable cases of possessed people. Sage and rue plants were utilized abundantly in the Middle Ages in order to combat the evil entities that possessed people. The smoke from these plants was utilized. Sage is one of the most efficient plants in order to combat cases in which the body of a person is possessed by an evil entity that obsesses the person and even makes him demented. The elemental of the sage uses a pale, yellow-colored tunic and has the marvelous power of healing the possessed. This plant must be harvested during the night. First, it must be blessed, then it must be yanked by surprise from its very roots. The plant must be crushed, and the pressed juice is given to the possessed one to drink. Its leaves can also be pressed within water, and this water is then given to the possessed one to drink. The plant must be burned so that the smoke may be utilized for the possessed one. The smoke from the plant must cover him. The evil entity must be conjured with an exorcism. A gadget made with long pieces of glass and the exorcism from a secret book was employed in ancient times. However, the conjuration of the four can be used today. It is necessary to seat the possessed one on a chair and to draw a circle around him on the floor with a piece of charcoal. Also, the tetragrammaton, MM, a sign in front of which all the columns of demons flee terrorized must be drawn on the floor with charcoal at the threshold of the room, inside the room at its entrance. The two vertexes, feet, of the star of five points or pentagram will be aiming towards the outside of the room and the superior vortex, head, will be aiming towards the inside of the room. The magician must magnetize the patient with the firm resolution of casting the possessing entity out from him. Yet, he must never hypnotize the possessed one, because hypnosis is purely and undeniably black magic. The magician must conjure the possessing entity with the empire of his whole might. He must hold in his hand a sword or a knife with a new handle in order to imperiously command the perverse entity. This is done with the goal of terrorizing it, so that it will abandon the body of its victim. The elemental of the sage plant must be commanded to eject the evil entity out of the body of the victim and to keep him in custody for an unlimited time. When the victim is freed from the perverse entity that was obsessing him, then it is necessary to capture the perverse entity in order to prevent it from returning again inside his victim. Therefore, the medic magician must perform the ritual of the Bajuco de Cadena, Bohemia Excisa Hemsel. This ritual must be practiced in the following way. Bless the Bajuco de Cadena and command its elemental to enclose the perverse entity. Then, cut two lianas, bajucos, and put them on the floor forming a cross, and trace a circle on the floor around the cross in order to form our famous Gnostic circle, which is the cross within the circle of eternity. Then, the magician walks on the floor over the traced circle. He must start walking from south to north around the circle in order to return to the south again. One must follow the course of the circle by walking on its right side. The two bajucos de cadenas that form the cross will mark the south and the north, the east and the west. Therefore, they will be placed in accordance with the four cardinal points of the earth. When the magician finishes his revolution around the circle, as we already stated always walking towards its right side, then the magician will pass through the center of the circle from south to north, after having cut the center of the horizontal liana, the juco, into two branches. After having reached the north of the circle, the magician will walk towards the east of the circle, always walking on the right side of it. Once he is there, he will cut the other liana, the juco, in the same way as he did the first one and will resolutely pass through the center of the circle from east to west, thus moving forward without looking anywhere else. The perverse entity will remain enclosed in the center of the circle and in this way that entity will not return inside of his former victim. The elemental from the Bajuco de Cadena uses a yellow tunic and is very intelligent. He observes the ritual in silence. Then, 
He revolves around the circle while pronouncing his magical enchantments in order to apprehend the perverse entity. The following graphic presents to us the steps of the magician when passing through the circle. Start in the south, walk around the circle. Cut the horizontal bajuko in half step through the circle to the north. Walk to the eastern side. Cut the vertical bajuko in half. Step through the circle to the west. In this day and age, the possessed people go into hospitals for dementia, because the foolish scientists from this epoch are great charlatans who ignore these things. With this clue, many possessed people can save themselves from going into hospitals for dementia. They die in those hospitals without those psychiatric doctors, who are praised because of their very boasted about advanced methods, ever having the insight of investigating the cause of their illness. There are many crackbrain spiritualists, morbid theosophists, and sickening Rosicrucians everywhere who live comfort ably in the great cities and who criticize the author of the present book and his profound studies regarding elementotherapy. Yet, none of them have had the patience of interning himself in the jungle in order to investigate the vegetal elementals. How comfortable and how delectable it is to criticize while pleasantly seated and with quietude, without getting sunned or staying up all night in the jungle, without having to tolerate ants or venom, or poisons from ophidians. Those so-called super-transcended ones are not. Nothing more than parasites who live devouring the wisdom that the magicians acquired with supreme sacrifices. Thus, they devour it, not to comprehend, but to betray. This world is filled with social parasites and dim-witted critics. Those super-transcended, Foolish spiritists and spiritualists think that it is wrong to study the vegetal elementals without wanting to realize that the vegetal elementals are innocent angels and that in the epoch of Venus, the future cosmic day, they will be human beings and then later virtuous angels, solar pitries, and divine dianes. We, the Gnostics, know very well that the elementals from the plants will be the human beings of the future. Sicknesses due to consequences of the will of perverse people. If it is required to investigate the cause of a sickness that is suspected to be the consequence of witchcraft performed by the will of a perverse one, then a doll with bones of a rabbit, deer, black cattle, or tiger has to be carved. The bones must previously have been buried for a certain time. Thus, one must unbury them and make a doll as perfect as possible. Build an altar with an arch in its farthest end. Utilize a branch of wild totemo, calabash tree, Crescentia Pugit L, for the building of the arch. A branch from a sweet guava tree will serve for the cross of the altar. Place two flower vases, and in each one of them a branch of the plant called Bougainvillea or paper flower, Bougainvillea glabra L. The sick person must personally harvest the specified branches in the following ritualistic way, the branches from the totemo and guava by the eastern side and the Bougainvillea by the western side. The flower vases must be two crystal vases filled with water. A single branch of bougainvillea cut in two pieces will serve for each one of the two flower pots. The altar must be built under a guasimo tree, Guazuma Olmifolia Lamarck. Pronounce the mantras of the guasimo tree and beg the elemental to show the sickness of the patient in the water of the flower vases. The mantras of the guasimo tree are Maud Mud Hamaka the magician will remain kneeled before the altar. Then, after having made his petty tie-ins to the elemental of the guasimo tree, he will beseech the angel Aten to intervene in order for the elemental to move the water and speak through the doll. Have your sight fixed on the flower vases and observe what will appear in the water. If the sickness is due to magic from perverse wills, then the evil entities, the cause of the sickness, will be seen within the water. Beseech the angel Aten's assistance again and try to listen to the voice that comes out from the little bone figure. That voice will be clear and precise. Talk with it as if you were addressing a person. The healing of the sick person will be made by the elemental of the Guasimo tree. Pronounce the following healing mantras while kneeling before the sick person, ah, a, eh. ga, eh, goof, pawn, clara. Bless the back of the patient, perform magnetic passes, and give him the guasimo medicine to drink, which is the maceration of its leaves in rum for 20 days. Dosage, a little cup each hour.
The master of Wiracoca tells us extensively about these things in his initiatic novel of occultism and in his book entitled Sacred Plants. Therefore, we do not say anything new, unreal, or fictitious. We only give details, we discover what is ignored. Seferino Maravita One of the most astonishing medics magicians from the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta was the Indian Seferino Maravita. Sick people who suffer sicknesses due to witchcraft must call every night to the Mama Seferino Maravita, so he can cure them from their illness. The following invocation must be performed. In the name of Kaliswanga, the primeval god of light, son of the seven red seas and of the seven rays from the sun, I invoke thee, Mama Seferino Maravita, so thou can cure me from my illness. Amen. Curative words, mantras. I disagree with the magician Omar Cherenzi Lind when he affirms in his book entitled Om that the whole power of the verb is found in the silence, and that the verb must be silent. That gentleman wants to deprive us of the sublime and grandiose power of the articulated word. He ignores that the verb is of triple pronunciation and that it endows three norms, verbal, mental, and conscious. One can articulate with the creative larynx, one can vocalize with his thought, and one can vocalize with the superlative consciousness of the being. We speak about the great creative verb, and we teach humanity the secrets of the creative word in our book in preparation entitled Logos Mantra Theurgy. There are words that cure and words that kill. The physician's words are life or death for the sick person. A great amount of the physician's responsibility lies in their words, whether they employ their verb for constructive or destructive goals. No sick person should ever feel hopeless or condemned. The physician must always say to his sick patient, you are improving, you are being healed, your healing is increasing. Your sickness is disappearing, soon you will be better, etc. These phrases are recorded within the subconsciousness of the sick person. Consequently, the sick person will be rapidly healed. No matter how grave a patient might be or looks to be, the condition of his health must never be revealed as delicate or dangerous, etc. With these negative and destructive words, death is accelerated for the patient. When the patient is addressed with contrary terms, with words of hope and strength, his health can totally improve and be cured. There are words to cure the sick person, and magnetism combined with the verb becomes astonishing. The morbid fluids of the sickness must be taken with a way great flowing passes, that is to say, the morbid fluids of the sickness must be taken away from the head towards the feet. While they are being extracted, they must be burned within the fire of a lit candle or within charcoal embers. Afterwards, prana or magnetic vitality must be administrated over the solar plexus and over the sick organs with slow magnetic passes and with magnetic insufflations. The magnetic insufflations are performed by inhaling oxygen and prana and, after having mentally charged it with our vitality, it must be exhaled within a handkerchief and applied over the sick organs of the patient. This act must be accompanied with a powerful concentration of the will and the imagination, united in a vibrating harmony. The physician will imagine the patient swimming within a blue-colored sea, and will pronounce the following mantras or magical words. I gai goof pon clara. Aum tat sat pon ton pause. I gai a are gutturally pronounced by uniting the a with the e in a single sound, vocalized with the throat. The monosyllable om is pronounced d-o-m open your mouth very well with the a, round your mouth with the o, and close your mouth with the m. All of these mantras possess great healing powers. The masters from the white fraternity must be invoked in order to cure the sick people. The venerable master from the white fraternity, Huaracoca, wrote in some Gnostic rituals certain mantras in order to invoke the masters. Let us see some of them. Ethu o e. Ishurian, Aberton, Athanaton. Ethu o e. Sabbath. E a o. Others are as follows. Kyrie mitras hagios. E dot a dot o. Kyrie phale. Hagios, etc. The mantra Hagios, among other things, has the power of opening the whole atmosphere in order for the master to come. Really, these mantras are good for that purpose. However, 
there are other more simple, efficient, and at the same time shorter mantras in order to invoke the masters. Those mantras are the following. Antia da una sostisa. These mantras must be sung when pronounced. After having articulated them, the name of the master one wants to invoke has to be pronounced three times. Sick people can invoke the master Hippocrates, father of medicine, or Galenus, Paracelsus, Hermes Trismegistus, etc. The vowels e dot e dot o dot u dot a have great healing powers. 1. The vowel i makes the blood rise towards the head. It cures the organs of the brain and develops clairvoyance. 2. The vowel e makes the blood rise towards the larynx. It cures sicknesses in the larynx and develops the magic ear. 3. The vowel o carries the blood to the heart. It cures this organ and awakens in us the sense of intuition. 4. The vowel u carries the blood to the solar plexus, tip of the stomach. It awakens the sense of telepathy and heals the stomach. 5. The vowel a carries the blood to the lungs and grants us the power of remembering our past reincarnations. At the same time, it heals the lungs. These vowels are vocalized in combination with the letter N, like this. One hour daily of vocalization throughout our life makes us magicians. One can vocalize with the larynx, with the mind, with the heart, by meditating in the forces of these five vowels, such as we taught in the former pages. There are certain mantras in order to awaken the chakras or esoteric powers. These mantras are based on these five vowels. These mantras are the following, 1. Suera, middle brow, clairvoyance. 2. Suera, larynx, magic ear. 3. Suera, heart, intuition. 4. Suara, solar plexus, telepathy. 5. Suara, lungs, power to remember past incarnations. By means of these mantras, we carry the fire from our solar plexus towards all of our chakras in order to animate and awaken them. It is good to emphasize the importance of prolonging the sound of these vowels. Sicknesses of the mental body The mental body is a material organism. That has its anatomy and its esoteric ultra-physiology. The mantra in order to cure the sicknesses of the mental body is SM Han. The S is pronounced as a piercing hissing sound, similar to the sound produced by breaks of compressed air, like this, S. The M is pronounced as when one imitates the bellow of the oxen. The H is like a deep sigh. The syllable ON is pronounced by elongating the sound of the O and the N. This mantra must be vocalized daily for one hour. The disciple must invoke daily the Archangel Raphael and Hermes Trismegistus, supplicating them to heal his mental body. When the sicknesses of the mental body crystallize in the physical brain, then madness is the outcome. We study within the supersensible worlds the anatomy and physiology of 